session we're just starting it's going live now. okay so we start in five seconds Rit, over to you yes sir namaste and greetings i read lath researcher namaste and greetings i read lath researcher at impri impact and policy research institute Prabhav Evang Niti Anusandhan Sansthan Nai Delhi extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI Web Policy Learning. Today marks the last day of Young Women Leaders in Public Policy Fellowship, an online national winter school program, a two-month online immersive introductory leadership certificate training fellowship. This program is organized by IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center and would be chaired by Professor Vibhuti Patelji, visiting distinguished Professor Impri. This program had an excellent panel of experts who shared their expertise for the duration of this program. They include Ms. Kanta Singh Ji, Ms. Amarjeet Kaur Ji, Ms. Urvasi Prasad Ji, Professor Roxana Marianescu Ji, Dr. Simi Mehta Ji, Ms. Vedavini Namjoshi Ji, Dr. Purnima Chauhan ji, Ms. Seema Kolanrani ji, Ms. Sangeeta Reji ji, Dr. Niveda P. Haran ji, Advocate Audrey D. Melo ji, Professor Rukaya Joshi ji, Ms. Anna Usha Abrahim ji, Mr. Yash Agarwal ji, Advocate Dr. Albertina Almina ji, Professor Tulsi Jaya Kumar ji, Ms. Anjali ba Baba ji, Professor Sangjukta Bhattacharya ji, and lastly, Dr. Samardeep Chat uh, Chattopadhyay ji. We're honored to have Ms. Kanta Singh ji, Deputy Country Representative, UN Women India, joining us for day four, day 10. This will be followed with the program presentations, interactive session, experience sharing, discussion, and feedback by the IMPRI team. And lastly, we would conclude with, with chair closing remarks and vote of thanks delivered by Professor Viputi Patelji. The panel of convener comprises of Dr. Arjun Kumar Ji, Director, IMPRI, Dr. Simi Mehta Ji, CEO and Editorial Director, IMPRI, Professor Gumadi Sridevi Ji, Visiting Professor Impri and Doctor and Advocate Doctor Shalu Nigamji, Visiting Senior Fellow Impri. Proceeding further, I welcome all the participants to this enlightening deliberation and thank you for being interested and putting your time, energy, and efforts into fostering the development of young women leaders in public policy while helping us to bring together the practitioners and participants through this course for impactful policy research and action. We have also shared the course outline and reading resources in your email for your kind pursual. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind the housekeeping announcements once again. Please join the meeting on time. There will be a Q&A session after each presentation. Share your questions on the Q&A box. The questions must not be posted as an anonymous attendee. Ensure that your questions are precise. And lastly, re refrain from making general comments in the question to save time. Now, without any further ado, let's start our program. I am delighted to call upon Professor Vibhuti Patel ji to deliver the opening chair remarks. Ma'am, you're on mute. Good afternoon and welcome, Madam Kanta Singh ji uh, and all the esteemed participants. First of all, I would like to offer my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Arjun Kumar, Dr. Simi Mehta, Dr. Shalo Nigam, Ms. Priyanka, Shweta Shankar, and whole IMPRI team for putting this course together. And we have had extremely enlightening and electrifying sessions, uh, previous nine sessions. Today is the 10th day. Today is a day of solidarity, sisterhood, and uh, strength, collective strength of women. On March 8, we always take the balance sheet of what all we have achieved, what are the hurdles, what are the challenges, and what future pathway we are going to have. We dedicate, it, dedicate our efforts and provide tributes to our four mothers who gave us this day. It was in 1908 when women workers of textile industry in Chicago, they fought for labor standards, eight hours of work, 
eight hours of leisure and eight hours of rest, that formula to be adopted by the employers, humane working condition and childcare facilities. And they had to face tremendous witch hunting and they had to face social isolation, uh, ostracization from the community. But they that was the first collective effort of women in the human civilization, asking for dignity of labor, asking for women's rights. And it was declared in 1910, it, uh, the uh, Clara Zatkin, a famous trade unionist of Germany, in a big gathering, declared March 8 as a dedication to the these women's sacrifices and International Women's Day was announced. And that was the time most of the European countries were preparing for the First World War. Women were against it. And the new song that emerged and that got identified with March 8, International Women's Day, is uh, Bread and Roses. It is well known. And I think you must have seen, or oh, you can, if you, if you, if you access YouTube, you can see several famous singers who have sung this song on um. March 8 and even you know, in the March 8 rallies throughout the world, this song is uh, has, makes a haunting presence. It goes like this. As we go marching, marching in the beauty of the day, a million darkened kitchens, a thousand mills lofts gray, are touched with all radiance that a sudden sun discloses. For the people here are singing, bread and roses, bread and roses. As we come marching, marching, we battle to for men. For they are in the struggle, together we shall win. Our days shall not be sweated from birth till life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses. As we come marching, marching, unnumbered women dead, go crying through our singing, their ancient call for bread. Smart, small art and love, beauty their trudging spirits knew. Yes, it is bread we fight for, but we fight for roses too. As we go marching, marching, we are standing proud and tall. The rising of the women means the rising of us all. No more the drudge and idler. Ten that toil where one reposes, but a sharing of life's glories, bread and roses, bread and roses. So you can see how powerful this song is. And for nearly more than 100 years, women have been singing this song. Uh, on May, uh, March 8. Uh, the theme for this year's International Women's Day 2024 as declared by UN Women and we are honored to have a representative from UN Women uh, with us, Madam Kata Singh. And the theme is Inspire Inclusion, Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress for Fostering Inclusive and Equitable Societies through Economic Empowerment of Women and Girls, Despite many policies and legislations adopted to enhance women's contribution, we see that we have a long way to go so far as women's active work participation in the larger economy is concerned. Uh, we uh, had all the sessions which also were very much linked to this theme. Uh, the inaugural session by Amarjit Kaur highlighted women's role in the decision-making bodies of economy or governance of political participation in the uh, field of education and in the field of community development. Uh, on day two, we had a discussion which reflected on the uh, a development trajectory that women in India had to uh, face uh, in the last 75 years. So economic, social and political dimensions were examined. Ms. Urvashi Prasad, who works with Niti Ayo, she also highlighted her experiences of being in the government or first NGOs and the community-based organizations as a young social worker. And later on, now she has joined Niti Aayog and how young women are acting as a catalyst of change for building, for nation building. On third day, uh, my presentation was on empowerment and development initiatives taken by the state right from the first five-year plan in a post-independence period. The schemes and programs and gender responsive budgeting and the financial commitments for women uh, uh, development, their needs for health, education, employment, skill development and decision making and combating violence against women were examined. Professor Roxana Marinescu uh, enlightened the uh, participants with the global gender equality efforts in the four stages of 
uh, feminism, feminist activism, uh, four trends. First was a trend where feminism focused only on women's question. Second trend saw the, uh, the issues in terms of gender binary men and women. Third trend brought in the question of intersectionality and also the rights of gender minority and the fourth stage of feminism currently, which is informed by social media presence, lot of online campaigning and public uh, public opinion building, massive onslaught of our artificial uh, uh, intelligence and uh, technological uh, uh, invasion uh, within which how the digital communities are created by feminists. Day four was about the research article writing because this course also involves that participants have to express themselves through uh, either filmmaking or research article or photo uh, essay and uh, that, that the tools and uh, uh, technology uh, and techniques of writing research article from idea to publication was explained by Dr. Simi Mehta in a step-by-step -step manner. Uh, we also had a second presentation by a very active and enlightened bureaucrat, Dr. Purnima Chauhan, who shared her personal experiences as uh, IAS officer and how she brought in the very important concerns of women like declining sex ratio or garbage recycling or the towns, uh, safe city uh, as a when she was a Principal Secretary in Himachal Pradesh. She also shared her experiences of study tour of many other global cities and the learnings of that, which are extremely useful. They can be replicable to uh, in our context also. Day five was by, by uh, uh, Medavini Nam Joshi, who works in the CSR department of Ambuja Cement Company, where she talked about her own experiences of working in NGOs such as Vacha, working with the adolescent girls, and now in within the corporate framework, how is she creating an ecosystem where young women can lead with a purpose to make difference in their context. Uh, Sangeeta Rege from Sehat, the uh, director of Sehat, she discussed in a public health field and in the reproductive health rights movement, how young women are taking leadership. And she also gave the example of pandemic where 70% of the health workers, right from the super specialist to technician to doctors and nurses and sanitation workers were women. Day six was focused on de dealing with the big data because now everyone talks about analytics and metadata. So Dr. Soumya Deep Chattopadhyay enlightened the uh, participants about big data driven landscape and how to navigate data deluge in India. We all are inundated with data. Social media is generating massive data. How, what do we decipher from this data? We, how do we use our skill of social science or a pure science or applied science uh, to understand and come up with the data that can inform policies? Audrey de Mello, uh, uh, ad advocate and the director of Majlis, she also talked about the experiences of Majlis over the last four decades in championing safeguards for young women in public policy. And she also discussed the experiences of work kitty, handling the rape survivors issues, getting compensation for them under the state scheme of Manodaria. And she also how to deal with the POXO cases and some of the dilemmas of Juvenile Justice Act and the POXO Act, she discussed. Uh, day seven was about the uh, uh, Rokaya Joshi, who is in SPJ in Institute of Management Studies. She has been training people to be fit in the corporate world. She discussed the leadership lessons for young women in public policy. And Anna Usha Abraham, who retired as a vice president of Mukunda Iron's company, very big corporate uh, concern. She discussed the need for networking, effective networking, and what how networking contributes to personal development for young women leaders. And we had a young uh, activist and a very erudite orator, Yash Agarwal, who discussed the career insights for young women leaders in public policy. And he also shared his experiences of over the last 10 to 12 years uh, into the right from his student days, he was uh, working into the career enhancement uh, field. Uh, day eight was uh, dedicated to the advancing inclusivity in society in the legal framework and the kind of challenges and strategies that we, we need to uh, take into consideration by 
practicing litigation lawyer, uh, advocate Dr. Albertina Almeida from Goa. She discussed several experiences of Bailan Chosad, her organization in Goa, in taking up the issues of trafficking and uh, forced labor and uh, uh, the, the kind of development trajectory, the question of alcohol and uh, its aftermath, domestic violence, all these issues as a lawyer uh, and the, at the same time grassroots activist, how she, she dealt with. Uh, Dr. Seema Kulkarni, founder of Maila Kisan Adhikar Manch, she discussed the nuances of gender and climate change based on her first-hand experience of 18 states of our country, because Makam has been active for nearly seven to eight years, and how the farmers, uh, women, uh, recognition for women in the farm sector as a farmer and, and all the state policies, why they need to direct uh, themselves to, to women farmers. Uh, then we had an Anjali Bawa session on entrepreneurial journey. She, her, she herself is a person who is into entrepreneurial world and she has also mentored hundreds of young women to enter into uh, entrepreneurial field at the same time navigating challenges and opportunities for young women. The previous session, which was the ninth day, was uh, very, very important where Professor Sanchukta Bhattacharya, in a very, very erudite and lucid and logical manner, explained the complexities of diplomacy, foreign policy, and leadership of young women in public policy. How do they deal with the glass ceiling and how do they deal with the glass lift and also the, the misogyny and patriarchal biases in the diplomatic world. Uh, Dr. Nivedita Haran, she discussed, uh, she as, as an IAS officer, she shared so many of her inspiring experiences as a bureaucrat and as an administrator in uh, uh, in uh, Kerala and she discussed the role which the grassroots organizations can play and she said they are the most important otherwise it will remain a platitude. Uh, she also gave several um, uh, worth emulating and successful examples of intervention by Kutumbashri. Dr. Saumedip Chattopadhyay's uh, session as I told you was on data and uh, now today we have a uh, esteemed uh, guest, Ms. Kanta Singh, who would give us the valedictory address and he will also uh, make us understand the latest global discourses going on around gender equality issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am, for setting such a positive tone for our last day of the course and for such a comprehensive overview of the course. Thank you so much for being such a valuable part of our course, ma'am. Now, I would like to call upon Dr. Smi Mehta ji to introduce uh, Ms. Kanta Singh ji. Thank you, Reet, and good afternoon, everyone. Wishing everyone, those who are watching us here on uh, live and also later on YouTube and other social media platforms, a very happy International Women's Day. Um, this is with great pleasure and honor that I introduce Ms. Kanta Singh ji, who is the Deputy Country Representative of UN Women India will be delivering the valedictory address on this momentous occasion of International Women's Day 2024. Ma'am is a distinguished, ma'am has distingu distinguished herself as a former national level volleyball player and a Shevening Gurukul Fellow from the University of Oxford. And apart from this personal achievements, ma'am has a distinguished development professional career over a period of two decades. And she brings herself with herself a wealth of experience, ranging from extensive experiences in spearheading pro women development programs, women led development programs, collaborating both with national and international entities to advance women's participation in the formal and um, formal sector, formal economy, sports and political spheres. Very notably, ma'am has served uh, with distinction at the UNDP for a period of nine years prior to assuming her current role at the UN Women India. As the deputy representative, Ms. Singh's unwavering commitment to promoting gender equality and equity continues to be instrumental in shaping the transformative initiatives of UN women. Therefore, Ms. Singh brings with herself a wealth of expertise in program management, resource mobilization, advocacy, and capacity building on gender issues and broader human rights. We would not, we would have been uh, we are very unfortunate, we are very, very, very fortunate that ma'am has been able to join us and it is a moment of pride for all of us at IMPRI 
to be joining her today. Ma'am, you're welcome and wishing you a very happy International Women's Day. Ma'am, over to you for your Thank address. Thank you, Simi, and uh, I wish everyone a uh, happy International Women's Day. I'm so happy that all of us are celebrating it together. This is not the first time that we, we are together. In fact, number of young women that I met since morning um, have been asking us to what is there to celebrate and what, uh, what, what what's happening in the world? Where do young women go? Young young women go. What is what are their aspirations and how the world is 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 coming together to fulfill some of those aspirations? But I think there's a lot to to celebrate. Um, and and let's start only about India. I would also like to congratulate Impri for bringing together this cohort of young women leaders who are ready to learn and who are ready to play their part in in. In, in shaping public policy. So let allow me to start with public policy as a subject. So young friends who are here today, um, let me tell you that public policies um, in, in a country like India are not shaped the way we study, or they're not uh, formed the way we think public policies are written or are, are, are um, brought in the public space. Uh, there's a lot that goes on before a, a policy is brought, and Vibhuti, who's here and who's been our mentor and guide in in Women Power Connect, would would tell you more about that, and must have already spoken about it. It's a it's a completely different experience. So if you have a feeling that they will come to you as young people and will ask you what you want and how you want the public policy space to be in. You'll be, uh, you will be um, kind of sad about that because that's not how it happens. So somebody who is who is trusted by the government is asked to write a draft of a policy. Sometimes it is brought in the public domain and sometimes it is not, depending on how soon they want the policy to be out. Um, so in many cases, these policies are not very inclusive. These policies don't carry the voices of people like you all, young people, and um, when they when we start uh, implementing some of those policies, um, they don't work the way we thought they will work for the the right stakeholders. Uh, it also happens that the the budget that is required for implementation of that policy uh, is either not there or is not sufficient to implement that. So you will be disappointed in many, many senses when you talk about public policies. Um, and what we what we learn in in public in in um, colleges and universities and particularly schools of public policy, and uh, don't reflect the real scene. And um, as I said, Vibhuti knows it better. But that doesn't mean that you can't contribute to public policy making. Um, there are multiple forums through which you can uh, let um, let let your inputs get in, um, particularly on on policies related to women, because of the the efforts of many women who have contributed to a space where uh, where women's voices have been heard. I think there's still some some. Um, some hope for all of us where government does come out and say, okay, we want to have consultations with different stakeholders and different kinds of women. So they go to civil society organizations, they go to colleges and universities, they, they do go to young cohorts like yourselves. And in many cases, fortunately, unfortunately, many consultants who are sitting from the, from the consulting firms are also writing those policies. I don't know how many of them and understand the context, but but they do write policies. So I'm hoping that some of them do put in issues of young women like yourselves. So that's the first point I wanted to make. So so know more about the practical side of policy, public policy making. Don't just go by the book. That's not how it happens and 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 plays out. Second point is on the International Women's Day theme today. How do we invest more? In for gender equality. And here we are not just talking about financial investment. Uh, of course, the theme is focusing more on financial investment. Uh, but I think we as, as students and as leaders should think slightly more broadly about what it means. Uh, 
And I, I'll go back to what Vibhuti said. We, we, we need to bring in more inclusive societies. That also means that we need to unburden men from the, the, the traditional roles that they have been playing by sharing the responsibilities that they carry out of being a provider, but also, uh, also aspiring to do what men have been doing traditionally. We also talk about women who have been left behind. We also think about women who are physically not in a condition to go out and talk about these issues. Uh, we also talk about women who are living in Ladakh region or the most remote districts. So as, as students of public policy, we need to mm -hmm. think about everyone who's been left behind and different kinds of women. They're not just one kind of women. There are, um, discrimination happens in so many forms and we, we need to know what those discrimination areas are and what can we do about those. So when we talk about a public policy and inclusive public policy, that is exactly what you need to think about and play a role in understanding more, getting data, generate evidence, and then, then bring in those inputs into the public policy. So that's one. Also, if you talk about financing, I think public finance is just one of the tools uh, that, that, that is used to fund women-related programs. There are multiple other ways of bringing money in women's hands. Of course, there needs to be private sector which, which invests in women, skilling, employment, education, entrepreneurship. There are multiple ways through which private sector is funding, but we also need to bring in private sector banks and public sector banks to have blended finance models. So gender bonds, um, the, the traditional ways are not going to work the way they have been working. I think to, to, to get more women into the financial markets, as, as they say, uh, where they are not scared of finance as a subject, number one, where they're not thinking that it is man's job to, to bring money. It is not a man's job to, to also work in the financial markets um, or, or also be in the banks. I think we need to start thinking afresh and bring in more women there. Initially, you, you, would, you would remember, they used to say, rocket science. This is not a rocket science. And see how women are running the running ISRO in a country, right? So there's nothing which is uh, which is uh, which is that, that that you can't do. Actually, you can do everything that men can do. Uh, so and including finances. Um, the third thing that I I thought um, we are not investing enough in women's leadership. And, and leadership is not that, again, the traditional leadership where you have men in black suits and, and sitting together. And so every woman who is able to, uh, to take care of herself and is also taking responsibility for some more people is a leader to my mind. Your mother could be a leader, even if she's not, not, not literate in the traditional sense. So, so, so we need to start recognizing unconventional ways of leadership and and then 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 spot women who have been playing that role they may not be sitting in boardrooms they may not be running factories they may not be running financial markets but they still are leaders and so we need to invest more in those kinds of women who are running their households for example to uh, to also running small businesses or also um, panchayat leaders, also anganwadi workers, all of them are social leaders. So, so let's leave the traditional definition of leadership and invest more in women's, women's agency, women's voices and women's leadership. That's the third point that I wanted to make. As students of public policy, when you go out and start interacting with women who may not be as privileged as you are, you also need to think about the, the values they bring, their experiences. So we cannot belittle or cannot negate the experiences they bring. In adult learning, there's nothing right or wrong. Everybody who is speaking something is speaking from her experiences. So that means we need to value that. Uh, you may be in a position tomorrow where you are heading a big corporation or you're heading a big NGO or, or a big company or a, or a section eight company or section 25 company. You may, you may all be in that and you will be in those positions. 
then how do you make your company or your organization more inclusive? And that is where all these learnings that Impri has uh, has given you or the investment that they have made in you would would be useful. Otherwise, if you'll continue to do the regular work, it it will not be very um, very useful. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk about is is the green and clean economy, right? Um, right now. Uh, for 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 decades now, we have been talking about men running the economy the way they want, while they are destroying part of it, but also making money. As women, we need to think about new ways of of generating wealth, and green energy and green uh, economy is the way forward. Um, that means you invest more in 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 the actions that can that can. Um, stop the, the, the impact of climate change on women's lives, uh, particularly women who are working in the agriculture field and who are dependent on those sources of income which are climate, uh, uh, those are affected by climate change. Uh, so that is one, solar energy, also um, vehicles that are uh, are not polluting the, the air that we breathe in, um, also families that are dependent on those kinds of income, I think we need to start thinking of new way, new um, ways of, of, of helping helping the economy, not the traditional ways always. And the last point I wanted to make was that look around and see how women have been carrying the burden of care work and how you as young leaders can start thinking of your families as in when you have your families, I'm not talking about your parents and so when you have your own family, whether it is one person or two people or three people, how do you divide the social uh, norms and roles differently? How, um, if you have a, you decide to get married and have a man in your life, how do you share the household burden? How do you share the burden of child um, child care? How do you also take care of your parents where everybody in the family is, is playing a role? So the burden of care is something that you will need to address. People like us in our age um, are still being guided by what our parents taught us, that the cooking is still a woman's job. I think that needs to change quickly and you need to start playing that role where you demand that if I'm going to work outside or if I'm going to earn money, uh, that means the equation has already changed. That means others other members in the family have to start sharing the burden of care work. And there's nothing wrong and don't have to feel guilty about that, that you need to start demanding some you time. As they say, me time. So start demanding that. You will not be selfish by saying, I want even, I want to be happy. And that is one decision that should lie with you. But uh, other than these things, I just want to tell you that you are born at the right time. This is the time for you to realize your dream, aspire big, just go out and do whatever you want to do and and uh, and reshape and restructure the society the way you want. This is a perfect time to be in India and to be born a woman uh, because things are changing every day. And if you start looking at challenges, there are multiple, but I'm saying as young people, you should not looking at challenges. You should be overcoming those challenges. And I'm ho I'm hoping that you will many of you will you you'll be big leaders and as I, again going back to the leader um, you will be shaping many other lives by your actions um, also lifting other women with you also be support to each other and also learn from each other with those words um, thank you very much and all the best for your future I'm available on LinkedIn or. Uh, many people have my phone, so I'll be happy to uh, to do my bit for your future. Do reach out to me. Thank you very, very much. And thanks to Impri for inviting me to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Yes, Reet, over to you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for generously sharing your valuable time with us. Your insights and reflections have truly resonated with us all. Your decade-long commitment to advancing gender equality is commendable and serves as a guiding light 
to uh, us in our collective pursuit of a more equitable world. It was truly an honor and privilege to have had the opportunity to learn from you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll take your leave because I have to attend the program. I'm really sorry, but if if anybody has questions, um, please do write to me at kanta.sing at unwomen.org. I'll be very happy to respond to your queries or LinkedIn is the best tool to, to, to reach to me. But thank you. I have to leave now. Thanks a lot. We have been following you on LinkedIn and we have read thank all you, the Vibhuti. interviews of yours. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Vibhuti. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Now, moving on to our next session, I am delighted to call upon Priyanka Ji to give us a brief on the Anthology of Essays book to be published by Impri. Yes. Hello. Good evening, everybody. I hope I'm clearly audible. Yes, you are. Uh, yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so for the fellows who have been submitting their abstracts to us and uh, their presentations that we have received, we'll have more presentations today. Regarding that also, I'd like to say that uh, we have uh, four to five names already of the people who have agreed uh, to present today. If there are more who would like to present their abstracts today, they can uh, type their names in the chat boxes so, can, so we can align and we can have a row number for everybody. Uh, if that would help. Uh, now I'd like to present my screen. This is for the fellows who have been submitting to us their abstracts. Uh, on our previous uh, cohort uh, L for LPPYF, which was Law and Public Policy Youth Fellowship, uh, the Promoting Human Rights and Ending Gender-Based Violence, uh, similar to this fellowship, uh, we had an abstract submission creative project uh, uh, creative project uh, for uh, this fellowship as well. Along with that, uh, we had asked the uh, fellows to kindly submit their essays to us, which we have compiled in this book, uh, which is LPBYF, an anthology of essays on promoting human rights and uh, ending gender-based violence. So uh, this book is available on IMPRI's uh, website, IMPRI Books. And uh, as you can see here, uh, this book uh, has the fellows' uh, essays. Uh, they were submitted to us and... Uh, we can find them here. So these are the contents of the fellows that submitted their essays to us. Uh, let's say contextualizing gender and rape cases by Bharti Agarwalji, uh, the seven fellows who submitted to us. Uh, similar to these, the fellows who have been submitting to us their essays in this format, they will be published in a similar book, which will also be titled an, an anthology of essays and uh, followed by the name of this fellowship. Uh, next, uh, this is the format in which uh, it will be displayed in the book as well, uh, as you can see. So this is uh, to uh, just to give you a description of how your uh, essays that could be submitting to us are going to look like in the book format. This book, once again, you can it is available in the Empty Books website. So we'll also be putting the link on the chat box as well. So I encourage more and more uh, participants to please submit to us your uh, essays in a chapter form, the abstracts that you have submitted to us so far. Uh, we have uh, shared with you uh, guidelines uh, in the form of a COR document. In that guidelines, you can uh, see how you can convert your abstracts uh, to the book chapters. Kindly look through that. If you have any issues, you can always write to us at learning at And uh, this is how your uh, work is going to look like. So I encourage everybody to maximum participants to kindly please, if you have done the abstracts, go the extra mile and please do submit uh, your abstracts to us in the book chapter format. Uh, we'll be available to assist you with that on our email, which I have uh, said already, learning at empty at the rate gmail.com. Uh, so that's it. Well, I'll just show the book cover once again. This is how it's going to look like. It has its ISBN number uh, as well. So kindly do submit to us. Uh, that's all from. Thank you so much, Priyanka ji. Uh, now we will uh, proceed with the presentations from the participant teams. This is the sequence of the presentation for, for today. Apart from these, we request rest of the fellows who wish to present to kindly type in their names in the chat box. So I have shared the um, sequence in the chat box. First of all, it's Zulekha Ji. Please uh, start, get ready with your presentation and...
moving on to the next person, Deepika ji, if you can get ready with your presentation. Can you move to the third person? Oh. Anisha Koshi ji. So the third person is uh, Anisha ji, if you can start presenting. Ria Yadav ji, if you would like to go ahead. She's there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Lee, yeah. Haji has started. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, so I'll be uh, presenting my screen. Title, please. First slide, I think. Slide visible? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sulekha Kumari Das, and uh, I'll be presenting on the topic uh, stalking, psychological harm, and a lifetime of fear. An yeah, analysis the of the. Slide. Please show the first slide. Analysis of the awareness and uh, impact of uh, stalking. Uh, my research will mainly examine stalking as a serious human rights uh, violation in the current times by focusing on the nature and impact of uh, stalking. Uh, it will assess the level of awareness or rather the lack of awareness among youngsters today about stalking while also giving an insight into how problematic media portrayals of uh, stalking as normal and romantic in today's time are, which uh, not only help uh, stalkers validate their uh, behavior as uh, normal and romantic, but also deter victims from reporting uh, the, uh, the crime. So, Lekha ji, okay. are you doing a full screen presentation? Is the screen full in your screen? And we are on yes, third yes. slide. So, I think you should start from first slide because you have given your framework in second slide, no? Uh -huh. Is the first slide visible? No, no. this is third. Are, are seeing... What we are seeing is the third slide. Mm -hmm. Slide okay, number three. Okay. okay, just give me a minute. Can you come working mode? Escape button. Yes, first share kar lije ek bar. Share screen, yes. Ah, sabse pehle pe, ah, present, yes. yes is, very... is the first slide visible now? No, yes, Take. now it's oh. visible. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, as I was saying, uh, my paper will uh, focus on uh, stalking as a major human rights violation. It will mainly examine three areas. Uh, first of all, it is uh, it will examine the awareness or rather the lack of awareness about stalking among youngsters today, mainly college going uh, students for which I'll be conducting a survey through a Google form. Um, it will showcase how problematic media portrayals of stalking are in spreading uh, misinformation, uh, which helps uh, stalking uh, stalkers validate their behavior as normal and romantic as it, as uh, an expression of love while deterring victims from um, reporting the crime. It will majorly also examine the impact of stalking and how it constitutes a major emotional and psychological abuse that from which uh, from which victims suffer throughout their life long after the stalking has already st uh, stopped. For the uh, creative project, I have uh, chosen to present a poem uh, which will uh, which will portray the amount of psychological and emotional abuse that stalking uh, causes. I'll begin now. Um, in whispers soft, he shadows my day, a past that won't seem to fade away. His texts, his calls, they won't let me be, a constant reminder haunting me. I used to laugh, I used to smile, but now I'm wary all the while, afraid to trust, afraid to confide. In new friends' arms, I still can't hide. Alone I walk, yet never free. His shadows loom like a silent warning. With every step I take, he follows near. A constant threat I always fear. The memories linger, they won't let me go. The fear of him, it continues to grow. 
I try to move on to break free, but his ghost still haunts, tormenting me. I long for peace, for a life without fear, to wipe away the traces of tears. But until then, I hold my guard tight, praying for safety in the night. If you can see my screen, there are some latest statistics uh, related to stalking. Uh, according to uh, 2022 uh, National Crime Records Bureau data, a stalking case is registered every 55 minutes in India. Uh, the latest report that was published in 2022 also showed that uh, around 9,285 cases of stalking were reported in one year alone, despite the fact that scholars have pointed uh, stalking is a seriously underreported crime and often police ends up dismissing uh, reports that are filed as unnecessary or not so serious. Despite the fact that stalking cases have in the last uh, one, uh, almost one decade from 2014, when National Crime Records Bureau first started to uh, record stalking cases, it has risen, risen by about 97% from 4,699 to about 9,285 in 2020. In the end, I would like to reiterate once again that stalking is not normal. It is neither romantic nor fun. Girls do not like the chase. It is rather a grave violation of human rights, which causes immense emotional and psychological harm towards the victims for a longer time, long after the stalking has stopped and often has a lifelong impact on their psychological well-being. It is also a precursor to atrocious crimes such as kidnapping, murder, and rape. And therefore, it is high time that stalking edu education, awareness, and sensitization is carried out not only among youngsters and the general public, but also public officials to ensure that stalking is not an underrated, is not an overrated crime. It is a very serious uh, crime, and there needs to be education and awareness spread among the public about acceptable and non acceptable norms of behavior. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have limited the amount I have uh, talked about stalking. The more will be in, covered in the essay that I will uh, submit uh, to Impri. Uh, thank you. Thank the you. The verses are written by you. The poem that you recited. You uh, it, it, it has been written by me and a friend of mine from whom I have taken help. Uh, it is drawn from both our experiences. Uh, yes. Very, very moving. Yeah. So it will be around 4,000 words, your essay? Uh, yes, ma'am. So it would be like a chapter, yeah. So you can go even up to 5,000 5, if you get case studies, in-depth case studies, and also some other interviews of the officials uh, in the women's uh, cell within the National Commission Women or State Commission for Women or police or women police, Mahila police. Sure, ma'am. Thank Very you. Very good. Excellent. After a draft, Sulekha, so please write to me, Bhuti ma'am. One time, you can yeah. take a suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. You can submit it in our journal. Bhuti ma'am, please. Sure, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you so much, Sulekha ji, for your presentation. Uh, now, Deepika ji, if you can uh, go ahead with your presentation. Because we cannot hear you. Hi, can you uh, hear me and can yeah. you see my slides? Both, yes. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to present. Uh, so um, today I'll be uh, spending uh, five to seven minutes to share briefly. So I um, lead um, the um, Women in Global Health India chapter. Um, I'm part of the co-founding team and I'm, I also chair India chapter currently. And uh, it's been now five years that we've been working on building this movement dedicatedly uh, to advance gender equity in uh, health space. Um, and I'll be sharing uh, some of the reflections uh, from the work that we have done. Um, and also maybe... Um, dropping some uh, spaces for you to contribute and us to work together. 
Um, so uh, starting from uh, the 2019 report uh, by WHO in collaboration with Women in Global Health, which was titled as Delivered by Women, Led by Men, uh, came with a startling um, statistics on the proportion of healthcare workforce, which highlighted that 70% of the healthcare workforce uh, comprises of women, uh, but in the leadership positions, only 25% of uh, these leadership positions are held by uh, women. Um, and hence, uh, the leadership positions are dominated by men. And in 2023, uh, Women in Global Health came with another report to confirm that the, the statistics hasn't really changed, uh, that in 2023, still more than 70% of the healthcare workforce comprises women, and uh, the uh, proportion of leadership positions that are held by women still continue to stay at 25%, uh, indicating that the progress has really stalled and has not made um, any inroads in changing the statistics. And this was uh, specifically the report that talked about um, the, the uh, kind of um, unchanged status of women in leadership positions within global health. Um, that means that over the past five years, um, there hasn't been much change. So, and uh, the argument was that if we assume that the default health worker is a woman, why can't we also see that default default health leader should be a woman too. And that was, um, you know, a campaign to advocate for uh, more um, women in leadership positions. Uh, women in Global Health did a lot of, uh, you know, gender count across different um, spaces. For example, within the Fortune 500 healthcare companies, they see the proportion of uh, CEOs, um, positions, particularly CEO positions held by women, uh, were only 12%. Uh, World Health Assembly, which is one of the also referred to as the Mecca or of uh, global health, um, also had 23% uh, of uh, the delegations, um, country delegations led by women. This was 2022 data, and I had a chance to visit and attend World Health Assembly in 2023, and uh, there was a promising increase of 9%. So this first proportion got raised from 23% to 32%, but still far from 50. Or even if we look at, um, you know, 70% of the healthcare workforce is women, then hence, by um, proportion, ideally, we should have more than 50% of the women in leadership positions. So we're far away from that reality. Even within ministers of health, 25% um, of the positions were held by women, uh, deans of top 20 public schools and medical schools, 30%, and healthcare workforce continues to be 70%. Um, and if we uh, expand this healthcare workforce beyond, which includes uh, the health and social care workforce, then the proportion increases to 90%. Uh, primarily, uh, we saw that during the pandemic, women lost ground in health leadership, uh, and we did uh, a bit more of statistics highlighting these uh, numbers that proportion of women got decreased, particularly, for example, the COVID-19 task forces in 2020, we reviewed 115 uh, national uh, such task forces and committees that were formed, and 85% of the uh, positions were uh, held by men, uh, which excluded women from decision-making spaces. So what is the argument here that across different cultures and contexts, we see that uh, women continue to experience similar challenges, common challenges while accessing leadership in health. And primarily um, across these three challenges, which have been covered in several sessions that we have um, uh, been part of uh, in this training program. One is the gender norms that limit women's participation at work and leadership. Second is the motherhood penalty or the other gendered experiences that make us feel discriminated against. And third is the gendered stereotype around leadership that deter women and also sometimes penalize women for being ambitious and um, aggressively, you know, pursuing leadership positions. Um, and if we look at actually the benefit of equal leadership for women in the healthcare sector, we see actually there, there is a three-pronged um, uh, strategy for it that uh, when women are enabled to enter leadership, their professional expertise and perspectives strengthen the health system and healthcare delivery and an equal health workforce based on safe and decent work for all healthcare workers. Course, 
um, equal career progression for women. This will attract new um, recruits to fill those vacancies and uh, retain um, expert women, which will provide a stronger foundation for health system and uh, in a way kind of help us achieve those um, uh, sustainable development goals as well as the universal health care, uh, health coverage goals, etc. And then um, as women enter leadership positions and formal sector jobs in the healthcare sector, women health workers will gain income, autonomy, which which will benefit families. So early career men and women will also have more senior women role models in breaking the gender stereotype of seeing men as natural leaders. So that will help us reap the gender div uh, dividend. And lastly, with new jobs created and filled in the he health sector that will drive economic growth, uh, that will help us um, Read the economic and social dividend, uh, helping us have a more gender equal health workforce, which will have positive impact for everyone. So this was like very briefly about uh, the work that um, women in global health at the global level has done. Uh, very briefly also sharing the journey that uh, India chapter specifically has uh, made in the past four or five years. So we started in 2019 um, and we started with asking this question that there are several organizations that exist um, in India that work on gender or health or at the intersection of gender and health. So what is it that uh, what, where the gap lies and where exactly we can make a contribution and that is where we realized that the voice of women on the ground delivering healthcare was missing. And uh, this somehow coincided with the pandemic. And at that point of time, we were hearing a lot of uh, how women um, healthcare workers are stepping out of their way and risking their lives and their families' health um, and going out of their way to, to reach to the community, provide the care, whatever is needed, do the surveillance um, and uh, screening, etc. And at that point of time, we started with our very first dialogue series on ASHA workers, doing it in three part, making it comfortable and convenient for different stakeholders, community level, state level, and national level, feel comfortable and share their experiences, their contributions, and importantly, the challenges that they were facing in their own faces and voices. So it wasn't mediated by me or some other researcher or some experts or elite women uh, who can talk very well and be a part of these um, webinars. So. Um, this was very, very well appreciated and pro it provided that space for community health workers and different other stakeholders to connect and make sense of that. What are the challenges um, that these community health workers were facing on the ground? Without any uh, idea of where this would take us, we received several requests to continue doing these dialogues for different cadres. Similarly, we did it for nurses and midwives. We did it for... Uh, SHG members and women collectives. We did it for elected women representatives. We did it for allied health professionals. Similarly, we received several other requests and we did uh, several webinars in collaboration with Oxford Policy Management. We did also a technical session series with World Health Organization India office to um, capture um, the impact of COVID uh, on the life of women using a life course approach throughout different stages of life. Now here, after after doing so many webinars, we were kind of happy that we were able to bring light to the issues and challenges of women, particularly the healthcare workers. Uh, but we didn't like where we felt stuck was that while these conversations were happening, we didn't see any change in the policy. We continue to hear narratives and stories and we saw uh, community health workers going on strike and they still, uh, their needs were not heard. They were not receiving payments on time. Social security was a challenge. COVID care was a challenge. So many other challenges which were not being addressed. They were awarded and rewarded at national and international level. So that is where we were feeling stuck that what is the value of the knowledge and the discourse that we are building on the contribution of community community health workers. We tried to also um, uh, 
prepare a demand charter just before the announcement of health budgets to send it to the ministers to advocate for that these are the needs coming directly from the community health workers and um, uh, that this needs to be incorporated and there has to be a budget allocation for that. We Sadly, we weren't very successful in that, but uh, the continued engagement and continued advocacy through uh, speaking at different events, through writing articles, these are all, um, you know, what we have been through our community, um, some examples that we have been able to raise voice again, um, you know, around the contribution of community health workers. So these are by WGH India members, the articles that are written, the um, representation in these discourses, international and national discussions, etc., was done. But finally, um, uh, where we are, and I'll just take a minute and close this, that uh, we received two grants. One, we received a small grant specifically on integrating gender with the universal health coverage, uh, which allowed us to participate in different events, particularly, for example, G20. So as part of the uh, G20, C20, Gender Equality and Disability Working Group, we were able to participate in different meetings and advocate for um, increasing women's participation participation in global health leadership and we were able to find some success in having women in global health identified as one of the key priorities. Similarly, we were able to participate in, like I mentioned, World Health Assembly, UNGA. We also were able to deliver a statement on the rights of frontline health workers at World Health Organization Seattle Regional Meeting that held last year in October end. Um, and uh, while we try to continue working on these efforts, we're still kind of figuring out ways on how to uh, contribute to policy uh, change for community health workers. Um, and any inputs or suggestions on this on how to do a bit more targeted advocacy that will be more effective would be really, really helpful. And very lastly, that we have received recently, we have received a grant where um, uh, we um, are asked to focus on women leadership in health specifically. And we thought that all this while that we have been advocating and amplifying the voices of community health workers, perhaps this is the space and opportunity where we can focus on the leadership development of community health workers. So we are in the process of doing consultations, speaking to different people, organizations who are working with community health workers or women leadership to understand that what is the gap for leadership development for community health workers so that we can design a program that actually responds to the needs and not really design a program based on the literature review or something where we were able to give due consideration to equity, diversity, representation, language, geography, contextual realities and importantly that we are not using an individual model but using rather a systemic model where we are able to integrate their training and help them um, interact with different actors within the health system effectively so more along the lines of institutionalization and sustainability of those efforts so uh, yeah any suggestions and comments along these lines would also be very very helpful so with this i'll um, pause and uh, uh, look forward to answering any questions and and your thoughts and inputs on this thank so you in your model uh, for health intervention who are the stakeholders um uh, could you explain like model as in so we will be working with the state or non-state actors or collaborating with the state and then how will you go about the entry point would be like the way one stop crisis center model was created so there was a yes. conscious effort to work with the municipal hospitals so stay an ngo worked with the government to the government yes. hospital and over 10 years of time doing action research training documentation and reflection they came up yeah. with the model of first of crisis. So similarly, yeah. in this, uh, yeah, universal access to health model, yeah. 
Yeah. So, yes, uh, I, I, you're absolutely right. So uh, we also thought that we have to identify, uh, you know, specifically starting at a smaller scale and exemplifying and demonstrating what can really work. But definitely with the state government, because we, we do not want to do just one off an activity and leave it because it is a small and time like it, we've got this grant for two years, 2024 and 2025. We don't know if we'll get an extension or something like that, but we want to make sure that whatever we are able to contribute, it has to be with some government mechanism uh, through maybe one or two states, not across the country because the money is not that big, but uh, at least to engage with state government and get their buy-in so that even after our grant finishes, we hand it over to the state and they can take it forward and they can integrate within their system. So Re thank you so much. Replicability, the geogra yes. uh, geographical specificity, specificity and the replicability. So that also yes. you will have to focus on. No? Yes. Different absolutely. geographical uh, context. How can yes. the model yes. be either upscaled or replicated? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So this would be your in-depth case study, huh? Yes. I heard that you will be using it with in-depth case study. Yes. This would yes. be uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Participatory action research method. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It it will be more along those lines. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Very very lucid and uh, this thing logically developed uh, this thing presentation. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am, and thank you so much, Zipika Ji, for such an insightful presentation. Um, now, moving on, Anisha Khoshi Ji, if you can start your presentation. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I hope that my voice is audible and my presentation is visible to all of you. Yes. Okay. So actually, I have started working on this and I've named it as Voices of Resilience. So, so far, we have heard about so many issues and how many uh, how we are trying to deal with all of them. Somehow, while I'm uh, sharing, I'm unable to move on to the next slide. Okay, thank you. So I'm trying to focus on two uh, Tibetan refugees and more than about issues, it's almost like a tribute to all of those people who tried, like it's been a long time since they moved to our country and they have tried to make sure that they are preserving their Tibetan culture and their identity as well as contributing to the host country that is India. And same goes for the one or two other countries that they have been to. So my presentation is a tribute to them and all the people who are stateless at the moment, but they're trying to make the most out of wherever they are. So I would begin with this, that the Chinese occupation of Tibet happened in 1959. And at that time, around 80,000 Tibetan refugees and His Holiness the Dalai Lama moved to India. And there are right now, I feel, more than around 39 settlements in India for Tibetan refugees. And going on that note, I want to share and present this video to all of you. Uh, let me know if it is not audible. Just a second. Not audible. Mm -hmm. Sorry, am I audible to all of you? You are audible. Was it visible? Yeah, only your video is not audible. 
Okay. Uh, I don't know how to make it uh, audible. So Just you a have second. Let me to allow the share sound. music. Share music. Yeah. Was it audible now? Now we we are not able to see it on screen. I think it's bit double click to enter full screen mode and Anisha Koshi has started screen sharing. Okay. That's what is written here. Yeah. Huh. the okay. image is there. Okay. Image is there. Okay. Um, I'll try again. Just a second. I'm really sorry for this. Share music. Share there. I'll just try with this and if it is not work, if it's working, then I'll move to the full screen one. Just a second. Yeah. Is it audible? Yes, it is audible. Okay. I would like to be born in Tibet, but that choice was taken away from me. Increase volume. Yes, ma'am. The volume is full, just a second. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to wait here. Ma'am, I'll try to uh, like play it directly from YouTube. Just give yes, me a second. Yes, yeah, that would be I easier. I generally uh, do like, that. Yeah. If I'm taking too much time, please let me know. I'll uh, continue after another participant if that is all right. Yeah. No, directly if you do it from YouTube, it will work because I also do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Just a second. Just a second. Yeah, so you'll have to. Just a second, I'm just. Now you'll be able to share. Okay. Yes. I would like to be born in Tibet, but that choice was taken away from me. I would like to go home and be a Tibetan in Tibet. For almost 1,000 years, we Tibetans lived in peace, free to pursue our religious and personal beliefs. In 1949, when communist China invaded Tibet, our peaceful existence was shattered and we were forced to endure the unthinkable loss of life, loss of freedom and the destruction of our homeland. Then on March 12, 1959, 15,000 unarmed Tibetan women came together against the forced occupation of our country by the communist Chinese government. I mean, nobody told them what to do. This came naturally to them. So I think this is something that we can be very proud of as women. Today, Tibetans around the world remember this event as the Tibetan Women's Uprising, one of the great movements of non-violent resistance in modern history. Yeah, really. What, what say? Hero. Pamu. Which we call Pamu. Really, hero. Heroic. 
1959, countless Tibetan women have become leaders in the peaceful struggle to rebuild our lives and preserve our cultural identity for future generations. I always feel how much longer can we remain like this? We are in exile trying to preserve this culture, trying to preserve the identity of the Tibetan people. But unless we go back to Tibet and do it in our own country, it's very difficult for us to, you know, maintain it the way we've done it so far. Even if we are happy, there is always this identity crisis like, I don't have a passport. I'm a political refugee. Even though I don't have a kid right now, I also feel that I worry that my child will not have the same feeling that I have for Tibet. That was a small clip and that talked about the first uprising from Tibetan people when the first time that the Chinese occupation happened in Tibet and how the people who are in India now and some of them who are in Nepal and one or two other countries, how they feel like they are trying their best, but somehow there's, a, I think there's an identity crisis that they are going through. And how did I first come to know about them? So during my time in Delhi, I when I was in DU, I went to Majnu Gatila and that was the first time I got to know about this in much more detail. And this is a picture like uh, that was in the Tibetan Journal and it is for Majnu Gatila. And I'll just be sharing one or two pictures from there. And uh, this woman, her name is Mrs. Rinchen Norzum and she was the president, she is the president of regional women's association for like uh, for Tibet and in Majdukatila itself. And going further, I want to show you these two things. One is this person and she sells laughing in Majdukatila and she has been doing that for a long time. And then there is this restaurant known as Dolma House, which is there from 1984 onwards. And even now I feel like uh, whenever I think about food, and the time that I spent there, and even during the time of demonetization, I almost felt more at home in this place than ever anywhere else because of the kind of hospitality and the kind of feeling of home that they offered to me even without having a home in my own country. So that's the thing that I want to share. Moving on, there is a place called Baila Kupte in Karnataka which is also known as the, which has the largest Tibetan population outside Tibet now. And this is a monastery from there, that is Namjoling Monastery. And a lot of people there are doing a lot of things to make sure that they can ensure the cultural identity that they have is continued and is taken to the next generation as well. And this is a picture where Tibetan women, they came together as, and to remember the failed uprising in 1959 and uh, that was the Lhasa uprising and this is where all the women and many others came together to remember and honor that day and going further I want to talk about how like I think we had a presentation about the Rohingya refugees who are in Cox Bazar and even many of them in India and how much difficult it is for them to get like assimilated here and how, what are the problems that they are going through. And I'm sure these Tibetan refugees also faced a lot of problems. And what I want to talk about is how much they put in or what the, uh, the kind of efforts, the kind of mobilization and how they transform their life here. Like they have been uh, doing so many of entrepreneurial things, starting from, let's say, making sweaters or winter wear. Same goes for a lot of other things like making homemade cheese and all of those that somehow help them to have this community and the sense of commu community here. This is a picture where like the Women's Empowerment Desk has organized a women's leadership development training so that they're trying to help their own to make sure 
that nobody feels that they don't know what they want to do and how can they get the resources to do what they need to do. And this particular slide that I'm sharing in front of you, this has a small clip or like a small picture from the website called Tibetan Children's Village, where they, that is like a school for all the Tibetan refugee children made by them themselves. And this is the goals or the mission that they have. And I feel that this is such a wholesome idea of what they want to have in the kids and the upcoming generation starting from an idea of their identity, their culture, and to make sure that they are doing something in a very sustainable way. And it was very inspiring for me to know about it. And I just wanted to share it with all of you. Going further, coming to my creative project, I wanted to share it as a piece of poetry. And this is the poem that I have written myself. It is not only directed to Tibetan refugees, but it is for all the powerless or stateless people out there who have been feeling this kind of a situation that they feel they can't get out of, but they still try. So it goes, Harkin, chess pieces all around, dancing on the board, deluded with their impact, drunk on mad power, broken, insecure and dead, their individual dreams and passion, questioning integrity with a lack of one. Shall we overturn the board? To remind, shall we overturn the board? To wake them up. Shall we remind and shall we overturn the board that chess pieces are just pieces? Alas, only important on the board. See the world maybe, love a little, live a little. Envying the peace of the powerless, brittle, broken, bereaved. Brittle, broken, bereaved hearts and souls, hush hush, moving just a single block. Blocked visions, crumbling kingdoms. Who will guard the guards? Who will guard the guards? Thank you so much. On that note, I want to stop my presentation. I hope that my ideas reach to all of you. Thank you. Very moving and analytically powerful presentation. And even your verses are so powerful. I wanted to know that are you going to also uh, focus on global efforts of transnational solidarity, what's happening, what the UNGA, United Nations General Assembly, UNHRC, and yes. international human rights organizations are doing. Will that also be part of your... Ma'am, yes, ma'am. While uh, trying to come up with this presentation, I did read a lot about it. But uh, like till now, I've not had any formal training in policy and how these things work. So I feel at times a little bit like an island in between in among in the sea so i'm trying to find out those things i'll try to incorporate those in my research one section if you can have no yeah. which you can give okay. an overview of the efforts made over last eight decades so okay yeah, i will 59 to yeah okay thank you so very much. good Congratulations. thank you so much ma'am and thank you so much anisha ji for your presentation now moving on ria yadav ji if you can start your presentation You're on mute. Hello, good evening, everyone. Just give me a second. I'll share my screen. Yeah. Oh, document here. Actually, I'm doing it through my phone, so I'm facing from the issue. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. It's, it's, it's visible. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. Uh, Ria Ji, we are sharing it from our side. You okay, can... okay. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. You can see the screen, right? Yes. Yes, yes. Go ahead. You can say next. We'll change it. Change. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. So, uh, I am presenting a research paper on topic Indian state response toward homosexuality. Please next, sir. Okay. So, this research paper focuses on how the Indian state, what is the role of the Indian state uh, towards the right of the homosexual people in India? As we know that all human beings must have the right to live their life with dignity. But in our society, not everyone has this right. Sexuality issues are considered irrelevant, elitist, and excluded from the human rights agenda for a long time. The normal heterosexuality is controlled by the state, religion, and the law. So this research paper seeks to examine how the modern Indian state recognizes the rights of homosexuals, uh, what is the what were the situation of the homosexuals in India during the ancient time, then in the colonial era, and now in the present modern uh, in, in this recent time? So this research paper using a literature review methodology using secondary resources uh, to uh, uh, analyzing various research papers, books, journals uh, to understand the rights of homosexuals in India. So. Um, at uh, so at the um, next slide, sir, please. So, first, let's understand what is the dif what is the difference among sex, gender, and sexuality. So, sex, sex defines what is sex is biological, while gender is a social construct. As Simone de Beauvoir says, that one is not born a woman, but rather becomes a one. In the term of as judith butler uh, explains gender is gender performativity like gender is a doing gender is performative what uh, what someone thinks about uh, themselves psychologically uh, they it uh, identifies defines their gender and sexual orientation is something that uh, to wide home a person feels attracted it defines that person's sexual orientation uh, please next slide, sir. So homosexual homosexuality homosexuality means when uh, uh, when someone feel attracted uh, emotionally, physically, or both uh, sexually toward the same sex person. It defines that person that person uh, we say that homosexuals. Okay, so homo during the ancient India, homosexuality was not considered as a crime not uh, it was not criminalized at that time and uh, various various texts of the ruth vanita salim kidwai uh, also uh, defines that what was the situation of the homosexual people during the ancient india so uh, hindu texts buddhist and muslim literature and various more uh, also show that evidence of the same sex love in various forms this is the picture of the khujraho temple please next slide sir so, uh, the, it was only in the colonial era, the Britishers criminalized homosexuality and they imposed the Section 377 uh, IPC. So, Section 377 defines homosexuality as unnatural offense. Whoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, women, or animal shall be punished with imprisonment for life or with the imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to 10 years and shall be liable to fine. So, uh, as Sumit Saurav Srivastav, uh, he argues in his article that state does not allow the space to the alternative sexualities and it discipline the desire. The, he says that state is straight as its legal framework supports and legalize heterosexuality and through its legal mechanism tends to discriminate and exploit those having homosexual tendencies. Nivedita Menon argued that patriarchy needs the institutions of compulsory heterosexuality to survive. 
एट पेट्रियार की अलाउस ओनली द फॉर्म ऑफ फैमिली टू एग्जिस्ट द हाइड्रोसेक्शुअल पेट्रियार और फैमिली विच इज द की टू मेंटेनिंग द बोथ नेशन एंड द कम्युनिटी so lgbtq activism challenged the heteronormativity and demanded the state to recognize the alternative sexualities and stop treating homosexual as a second class citizen in their own country please next slide sir so uh, there there is a uh, legal trajectory of decriminalization of section 377 i will not go into the uh, details so much but the uh, moment started in the 1990s 1994 a aids bedwa brodi andolan uh, ngo filed the petition in delhi high court uh, seeking to uh, repeal the section 377 decriminalize the homosexuality when the uh, some homosexual uh, tendin tendencies found in the tihar jail and uh, uh, the author jail authorities uh, denied to distribute the condoms in the tihar jail so from uh, that incident that moment started and in that uh, pil cancelled by the supreme court uh, it denied then again in 2000 were nas foundation and ngo uh, and uh, lawyers collective filed a pil in the delhi high court then in 2009 delhi high court decriminalized homosexuality and once again in 2013 when uh, suresh kaushal judgment came and various religious sorry religious groups uh, uh, go they went to the supreme court against the delhi high court verdict and then 2013 that was the black day for lgbt community because uh, supreme court again criminalized the homosexuality but after uh, after a, a long battle then in finally in 2018 on 6 september supreme court uh, recognized the right of homosexual people and decriminalized the homosexuality uh, then uh, even after decriminalization of homosexuality in 2018 homosexual people still they do not have equal rights as heterosexual people have so state uh, state uh, discriminate against them uh, as our indian constitution give right to equality right to liberty to all of us but uh, uh, state Uh, is not not treating homosexual people not and uh, dis, um, violating their right to equality so um, as the uh, misail foco argues that power enacted as a power uh, as a conceived and as a repressive power desire and ability of an agent to force the other to obey his command and this has resided in modern institutions iris marian young uh, talked uh, she talked about the gender logic of masculine protection so i am uh, taking his argument that she says that state often justify their expectations of obedience loyalty as well as their establishment of surveillance police detention and the repression of criticism and dissent by appeal to their role as a protector of citizens so state is so powerful state claim that state is protecting uh, their citizens while uh, i mean state is uh, discriminating against their own citizens and uh, uh, force them to obey his commands please next slide sir so uh, next slide sir yeah so uh, recently the legal this uh, supreme court verdict came that supreme court denied to legalize the same sex marriages and uh, uh, supreme court said that it is the, in the hand of the parliament they have to decide and they can only make the law there is nothing to this is nothing to do with the supreme court supreme court cannot make the law so uh, supreme court has uh, interfered with the inter caste marriages and uh, in, inter religious marriages hadia case judgment came but uh, now the, the court is not interfering in the same sex marriages anyway so now at last i'm giving some uh, the, some recommendations like there is a need to amend the special marriage act and surrogacy regulation bill 2021 
to uh, recognize the same sex uh, marriages and give the legal right adoption right to same sex couples and sexual har uh, harassment of women at workplace must also include the sexual harassment of homosexual people also and there is a need to develop the training programs and gender sensitive programs for health professionals teachers professors and for everyone at the workplace to sensitize them uh, toward uh, homosexuality and there is a need to amend the domestic violence act there is a uh, to include the uh, violence act which happened to homosexual people within their own their own houses so this is uh, thank you so there the lgbtq activism has come a long way and is still a long way to go thank you so you would be providing the overview of uh, all that has happened uh, regarding mm -hmm. in terms of laws and policies with regard to homosexuality right from the mm -hmm. colonial times till now okay so that would be your uh, uh, more of a history of uh, lgbtqia rights no it would be yes, that and what would be the uh, you'll also be giving recommendations yes ma'am at last time giving some recommendation that what should be done by uh, only one thing which is missing is that how the UN has played a pivotal role in uh, persuading the nation states to come up with the decriminalization and uh, decriminalization against LGBTQIA community and also coming up with the so social safeguards. So even the uh, aspect of gender budgeting, that also you should include and the uh, examples of Kerala and Tamil Nadu which have come up with a concrete uh, uh, intervention uh, for LGBTQIA community. Even the census, they have uh, Kerala completed census of transgender population and their um, and needs and demands age-wise. Transgender child, what would that need? Adult person, elderly person, person with disability, multiple intersectional vulnerabilities, all these issues have been taken. So I think literature from Tamil Nadu and Kerala will be useful. That can be called as a best practice. Plus UN Women has also come up with the gender responsive budgeting with regards to uh, gender, by, uh, gender minorities. That means transgender people. So that also you can, you can download it from UN Women's website. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much. Very complete. Thank, thank you. you so much, ma'am. And thank you so much, Ria ji, for your presentation. Uh, moving on, uh, Preetha ji, if you can go ahead with your presentation. A very good evening, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my topic is women's health care and English education. Uh, the combination of these two words have not have often been seen as what I realized as I delved into the research. So that's, um, yes. Um, for my creative project, what I've done is I have a skit being enacted by some students from a government school in Kanyakumari, which I will be playing, which will enact my topic itself. But before I do that, I wanted to give a context on why I have chosen this topic, right? Uh, women's healthcare and English education. So uh, as I do it, I want to compartmentalize my uh, context into two. One is language in India. So uh, when I say language in India, I'm talking about official languages, right? As per the Constitution of India, Article 343, you have two official languages, which is Hindi and English. But ironically or historically, the state, uh, our country has been divided on the basis of language, which means that there is a lot of linguistic division in our country. And uh, why I say that? So when I say there is a linguistic division, language has been taken as the base to build culture throughout our country. And by culture, I mean identity throughout our country. So when we are talking about language, we're talking about culture and identity. So language. Also state, governance. Also governance. Because we have also, something called Rajya Bhasha. Rajya yeah. Bhasha. Okay. So. so we are talking about a very critical point uh, when we talk about language. Uh, so as I said, identity and culture also comes from language. So when I say I am a Tamil speaking Indian, I take a certain pride uh, when I mention my language, right? 
but economics does not recognize this pride so what do i mean when i say economics by economics i mean money economic opportunities and any sort of opportunities that you can access in the contemporary world that does not recognize this culture or identity it might still not be clear so what i'm trying to say is english has become a language which has become a tool for any sort of upward mobility in the contemporary world english is a tool for you to sort of access any opportunities healthcare be it your law your legal system is in english in the contemporary world however only 10% of the entire country speaks the language according to the 2011 census what about the rest of the 90% even in our recent uh, nep 2020 we are talking about imparting regional language education for children uh, and i don't mean to say that i am against uh, regional language i love tamil i think a lot of intelligence the depth of intelligence actually comes from regional languages so i'm in for incorporating regional language but also equally promoting english because english is being accessed by 10% of the elite people who have been historically able to access that however the 90% have not been given this access and we still continue to do that by we say we want to protect our culture and identity we say we want to protect regional languages but at the cost of the 90% of the socio economic deprived classes so uh this is an overview on how critical english is and how we despite 75 plus years of independence we've not been able to provide this access to a huge mass of people on one hand on the other hand i'm looking at specific uh, components within this right when i say healthcare most of the medication that we have access to is in english like when if i have to say the expiry date it's in english medical terms are very similar like there is medisol and medisil tablet both just one word differences it's all in english we are able to make make out the difference but what about the rest of the population and there is a lot of migration in india and uh, i don't think it's possible for manufacturing industries to actually uh, print in 22 official languages the medical instructions so it has been a standardized procedure that english is going to be used for official purposes so not just for healthcare but for economic opportunities for, but to have equal access to your legal care for everything english becomes a crucial tool but still now not being given the opportunity to propagate equally so i think this is a crucial point i want to leave it as a question uh, to everyone uh, because currently india is the fifth largest economy and japan is already in a flux so if you're going to move to let's say third or fourth largest economy and if you're still not going to give english to the rest of the 90% then it's a huge question for the country so i leave it at that and i will be presenting uh, the skit enacted by uh, children from a government school in kanyakumari on how english is important for women's health care so you are making a point in favor of universalization of english uh, teaching learning yes uh, okay. yes but also emphasizing and i uh, just a little bit about my work also i work on uh, providing access to english education but through your regional language so you are also you are basically looking at a bilingual model of education for children so teaching yeah, english through regional language bangladesh did that for universalization they use the technology so bengali and english so to reach out to the mass on a mass scale did it but it's a small country so it's possible for india it's much more complex yeah. i will just be sharing my screen yeah <laughs> uh ma'am is my audio uh, audio and video visible video is visible not audio is it there on youtube then you can directly share from youtube that would be easier to get it's not on youtube it's a uh... okay try try sharing again ritha ji just a minute 
do i need to change any settings while i uh, present a video from the system no no, no. just share again Have you maximized volume of your audio? Pita ji, can you try some other uh, another video player? You can open it. Just go on the video file, click right, see which all player you are getting. Yeah, MP3. Then also. Hmm. Uh, media player, Microsoft, Clipcham, uh, and Windows yeah. Media. Videos made, uh, Windows Media Player, try. I'll just share my screen again. Give full sound. Is the audio, uh, audio is everyone is, able to? Audio is not coming, but it will come. Uh, increase the volume, then try sharing again. And, uh, full volume. Uh, is it possible that I share it with uh, the Impre team and they yes. will be able to present it from their end? Yes, we will do that. Is it on right, your drive? Is it on your drive? Uh, no, it's actually in my desktop. I'll I'll try to put it into a drive and share it with the team. As the others continue to press in, maybe in the end, if we can just share. Well, the let, us try, let us try last time. Go to now? share. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, start. I can try now again. Yeah, just a minute. Uh, okay, then I think I'll share it with the Impre team and if you can present it towards the end, that will be really helpful. Yes, please do that. Thank yeah. you so much, Pritaji. Um, moving on to our next presentation. Uh, Minakshi ji, you can go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Unfortunately, I'm just trying to switch on my video, but it's not letting me. Okay, one. Okay, yeah, yeah, got it. I've got that. Okay, I'm sorry. I am not able to switch on my video. Is it from your side? Some controls to 
No, right? No. Okay, I'll just uh, start uh, sharing my screen. I'll start my video, it says, but it's not. I'm not able to start my video. There must be problem of bandwidth. We will also switch off our videos, not you. Um, it will. It will do. I mean, actually, you go to stop, start, and stop video. I mean, it's completely it's switched. I mean, I'm not able to click on that. Like when I click, it doesn't res. It's not responding. There's and an up. Can you see an up arrow? You share my. Uh, if you don't, I, I'm sorry. If I I have a problem sharing my screen also. So would you mind sharing my presentation which I have sent this morning? Okay. We'll share with Akshay. Yeah. Thank you. Meenakshi, meanwhile, you can see the yeah. camera button, start video, stop video. There is an up arrow there. Okay. Select a camera. You can see which camera. Okay. You I think I'll just go to settings and see if there is anything that I need to do here. Uh, okay. Yes. I think I should be able to do it. Sorry, uh, not able to help here. Okay, so I today uh, I'll just start with my presentation. I'm really sorry that I do not, I'm not able to switch on my video. Uh, so before that, when I initially joined, I, I was able to switch on my video like um, before this. Okay, so I'll just start with my presentation. Uh, so gender equality and empowerment. Uh, so can I go to the next slide? So uh, I'm just talking about increasing women's participation in politics that is very close to my heart. So just to give a background about me, I've been working in the social sector for more than a decade. So it's it's almost 15 years now that I've been working at the grassroots level with the polit different political parties and with the uh, with people uh, for good governance and uh, um, and also uh, working for advocacy for uh, various policy level changes. And um, I was able to bring in this. Uh, uh, plastic ban uh, in the state of Karnataka at the policy level uh, in 2017. So this is my background. So when I say increasing women's participation in politics, I, uh, I the current status, whatever I've written, I, am, I think you can see it on the screen, but I just want to discuss in detail how challenging it is. Though we say that we have a res reservation for women in politics in uh, upper house and uh, we have state level representation and reservation for women, at the grassroots level, it's still a challenge, challenge for any woman to come up to that level. And uh, the challenges being like they have, uh, can we just move on to the next slide? Uh, so the challenges being this uh, structural barriers like uh, discrimination, political parties and electoral systems. And uh, so the first thing which I have experienced, so I want to share it with uh, Ms. Vibhuti Patel and I just want to take her inputs, how I can bring this onto the table by bringing a different uh, kind of policy level impl uh, implementation. So the thing what we face right now is like, though I have worked at, at the grassroots level and people have given me the support of, um, uh, of um, being a uh, um, candidate for the uh, MLA elections. So I wasn't able to get through into any political parties due and not only me, it's the case of all women leaders where we have been working closely at the grassroots level, we're not given the party ticket uh, due to uh, nepotism and also not having a godfather in politics and power play. And uh, so these are the so and also uh, the social barriers and religious barriers and everything. So, uh, so this is becoming a challenge for any women. Though we say that we have brought in 33%, are we are we having 33% in the political parties for us to get nominated the real candidates? This is uh, so. Do we have? Can we have 
any change at the political party level where some kind of policy framework which will ensure that the women who are deserving so can there be um, can there be um, uh, can there be some something like um, qualify eligibility criteria for a woman to get into politics or to be elected as a, uh, as a party candidate so can that also be included at the policy level that is one one of the questions uh, which i just wanted to ask today and and also so once we enter into politics there's a lot of mansplaining and gaslighting so mansplaining when i just say i have experienced it personally so when they look at women leaders the first thing for all men which is like um, you don't know anything so i'm explaining to you so where it's like condensingly uh, they explain explain the things which already we know about uh, we know about and also gaslighting happens very frequently and the women just gets dropped out at that level itself that they don't want to continue in politics so uh, and so women's role in perpetuate uh, perpetuating gender bias through inter internalized stereotypes and and competition for limited opportunities so this is happening at the grassroots level so though we may say so many things rosy and we are going to get more women in politics but we need to look into this side of politics where we don't have that take off from the political party level at or at the grassroots level itself so can we move on to the next slide please so uh, i've also written uh, about overcoming these barriers and challenges uh, so first thing is definitely the quotas which are which are making the changes at the political party level where they also need to recognize women they also need to uh, give tickets to the women for um, uh, contesting in the election and uh, there are like lot of capacity building programs which we do as women leaders for other women leaders wherein giving them the awareness how they can grow within the party how they can do uh, impactful uh, work at the grassroots and how they can get identity fired as a leader so we do all these women leadership programs for other women political leaders and we can see that these challenges can be can over can be like uh, avoided by giving that them that kind of awareness that they need to say stay strong and wait for some policy level changes to happen so that like they get recognized and get into the political system uh, without much of a struggle at the party level itself and uh, supportive policies and promoting female role models so that is another thing which i just wanted to uh, share with everybody is so we have seen many women capable uh, women leaders in the political parties where they remain as karyakartas till their retirement or till the end of their life so there has been a lot of uh, i mean there, there should be some kind of structure or framework or uh, and hierarchy that needs to be brought into the political system uh, so that is one of the ways which i uh, which i just feel that that can be advocated for uh, getting this policy level changes and um, there are like countries like rwanda who has the highest percentage of women in parliament globally with women holding over 60% of the seats in the lower house so probably if we if we go through the model of that uh, country then probably like we will be able to understand better and bring more women leaders into uh, politics uh, so next 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 slide please so uh, coming to the conclusion and measures so uh, the first thing which i couldn't progress or i couldn't take off from where i was uh, was the money like like the kind of funding which we require uh, for uh, contesting an election or getting nominated into as a party candidate so as um, uh, as the key speaker keynote speaker of today uh, ms kanta singh mention like crowdfunding and investing in women as the rightly as it rightly said in the theme of this year so many corporates and many private funding has to happen in politics to for more to encourage more women irrespective uh, i mean uh, more deserving women to participate in politics so that like there is no barrier for them financially that is the first thing uh, which comes uh, for any women to contest in politics and another another thing is promoting transparency and ac accountability in political processes to challenge entrenched power dynamics so as i had mentioned like a lot of 
structure can be brought into this considering uh, if we can consider politics as a professional career for women not as a service i've just spoken right now so we say that we serve the country and politics is not a profession politics is not so if we can think differently and think of another alternative as politics as a profession or a career for women where we can bring in more uh, women coming into picture without much of fear and there will be some professional uh, uh, attitude and behavior in the uh, in the system and also increasing women's political par participation is not only a matter of equality but also essential for fostering inclusive and effective governance so i uh, i just wish to say that uh, that if uh, we can have something at the grassroots level which uh, if if we can have policies where which will help women working at the grassroots level women working at the party level to get nominated that would be um, a great change and we can talk about the reservations then after thank you so much thanks for uh, giving me this opportunity and uh, thank thanks so much uh, professor for giving all the insights which has helped me come up with this thank you thank you so much minakshi ji for your presentation uh vibhuti ma'am if you have any suggestions or anything to add ma'am you're on mute to it one is that uh, uh, you haven't said what will happen with the new act passed no women reservation act 2023 think you yeah. need to fill out and do some forecasting mm -hmm. that now you have system and structure which ensures one third representation how yeah. is it going to challenge the political space and mm -hmm. the ecosystem because we saw in european union once they had 40% reservation for women parliamentarian so yeah. many things changed no the language which was used in the parliament or the old boys club which was taking nations decision uh, while in the pub after of, after parliamentary hours or uh, the corruption nepotism uh, yeah. not doing any work during the parliament but only all doing maneuvering and manipulation after the parliamentary hour all that thing had to stop when women demanded that they they meant business they were not the showpiece no they were not to be seen they had yeah. to be heard and they 40% means it, they had a, 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 they they could come together and shout together and put forward their agenda even the gender budgeting process also got intensified because they were there no in the european parliament now yeah. this is this, that's why you need to also see that how the things are changing at least in principle they have supported all political parties have supported women's reservation act are they going to give them candidature okay uh, mm. are they going to give them tickets in the coming election so yeah. i think these some of the important questions you need to raise number one number mm. two when it comes to rwanda or anywhere rwanda is the highest political participation now uh, mm. but you have to know the ethnic cleansing which killed all the men the 1990 the civil war started by 1994 there was a massive genocide and ethnic cleansing that happened only women and children were left elderly people were left all uh, adult men were killed the oh. the, the tutsis and kikuyus they the the fight it is in that context to rebuild the nation was completely devastated un women un hrc several un bodies also supported un peacekeeping force all of them they they played important role in hand holding of this people truth commissions and international criminal court uh, <clears throat> also took it up but i think that political economy and the situation background you need to know because it is very different from high work uh, high political participation of women in scandinavia scandinavia also has a very high participation sweden and norway and denmark and iceland in fact iceland women they are they, are, they can even mobilize 100% strike of women no? so you so small country but that is the power they have no and uh, all these 18 countries where you have women yeah. as a prime minister or president so i think you need to uh, go that the historical background and the label of women self mobilization how does it uh, 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 reflect on women's bargaining power in politics because oh. even in the panchayati raj institution we have seen wherever they are backed by the social movement or peasant movement or women's movement they are able to perform 
only when they are isolated the witch hunting and sarpanchpati and treating being treated as where the places where there are there is no history of women's movement that is the place they feel totally disempowered no? so i think other factors also oh, 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 should be what are the socio cultural uh, historical uh, factors which are uh, determining and which have bearing on women's political participation representation as well as voice both otherwise it would be only representation is a sarpanchpati phenomena women being treated as a as a puppet in the hands of male family members or male yeah. leaders so i think you have to bring it little more complexity and okay. the interrelationship into your work but it's a, it's a very important topic you have chosen and your personal experiences are very important oh yeah yeah thank you thank you thank you so much ma'am and thank you so much minakshi ji for your uh, presentation now moving on to the next presentation uh lopa mudra ghosh ji you can go ahead yeah uh yeah am i audible yes ma'am yeah. are you sharing your ppt uh yes yes i'm trying to share my ppt from smartphone or no no from my uh, laptop itself fine Yeah, we are. Okay. It's visible. Yeah, it's in working mode. You can make it in a slideshow mode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Lopa, you can also have the video on. Ah, uh, sir, I have extremely limited ah uh, network Bandwidth. supply. Okay. 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 So, okay. So uh, ah yeah. um so a uh, very good afternoon to one and all present here today i would be like i would like to talk on the role of uh, inclusive domestic politics in a nation's foreign policy i have uh, chosen this topic under the theme of uh, empowering the marginalized inclusive policy making for an equitable uh, india now moving on to the uh, key question of my research the key question revolves around how a nation's foreign policy benefits from the inclusivity in its domestic governance so as we all know that greater inclusivity invites greater number of foreign direct investments or fdis in the country and this strengthens the economic relations between two countries greater inclusivity also necessitates greater participation of women in the workforce and in this way women get the chance to play their due role in strategizing foreign policy of their countries now greater inclusivity also acts as the gate openers for new fangled innovations in important areas such as education healthcare science uh, scientific research and even spirituality through which the political socio economic intellectual and cultural stability of a society gets concretized and aggravated now so the question is now the the most important question is how do we engender this much required inclusivity in our societal dynamics in general and in domestic politics in particular so the simple one word answer to this is balance we need to establish balance between the intellectual political socio economic and cultural elements which play subtle yet himalayan and massive roles in our domestic political and governance infrastructures for instance the rural local self governance institutions such as the panchayati raj institutions which should strictly abide by the definition of self governance do not abide by the definition of self governance i come from a state called west bengal which see uh, which um, witnesses massive uh, political violence during the aftermath of elections as uh, as local as panchayati raj elections and i think the rest of india is not unaware about it given the important role played by the media in particular and by the uh, uh, government in general so we should make sure that the panchayati raj institutions are ruled by self governance 
no particular political party, no hooliganism, no kind of um, um, uh, unsocial or let's say unconstitutional uh, dynamics get to play their due role and uh, get a high hand in jeopardizing the political rights of uh, any citizen for that matter, not only women. Now, uh, moreover, no violence should be tolerated and uh, any kind of violence should be outrightly reported to the concerned authorities whenever any fundamental rights or any legal rights get jeopardized. Only then we can establish the much needed equilibrium between the voters and their representatives. Now, such a mechanism is also sacrosanct for ensuring that the problems and prospects of a constituency are not only effectively communicated, but also solved for the future time. And women play a key role in, 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 in all this mechanism. For instance, women have always been an inspiration for this country. Uh, for instance, the Chipko Andolan. Women's role in safeguarding the environment. Women activists can support animal rights activists and environmental activists, whereby communicating effectively to the government and the civil society to frame and implement robust laws to protect environment and legitimize the much needed right to life for animals, because animals are the backbone of the biodiversity. Women can initiate in organizational initiatives uh, because they are the force which infuses the much needed cohesion and governance. Women should lead the development of a robust, highly skilled, empathetic and flexible system of bureaucracy, the focus of which should be to balance out the polarizing factors which I mentioned just before, such as the complex political competition, hooliganism in name, uh, masquerading as politics, which underperforms a nation's capacity in all aspects. So the problem of West Bengal is not the problem of West Bengal anymore. It, it becomes a problem of India soon if it is not addressed adequately. So the aim of the political class should not be winning elections. The aim of the political class should be to collaboratively contribute for the highest good of nationalism, whereby obeying the constitution, whereby showing immense respect for the rule of law. As Aurobindo Ghosh rightly stressed on the need of aesthetics and governance and administration, I would like to emphasize that women should make it obligatory for the government and for their societies to implement the much needed aesthetics in our country's policies, which unfortunately, no government has profoundly focused on till date. Now, coming to the implementation of public policy, I would like to shed on the role of spiritualism or let's say the role of spirituality in our country uh, and in, uh, in our country in uh, particular and in our public policy framework in uh, general. So implementation of public policy is an activity between human beings by which diverse and conflicting claims of various holes in a polity are conciliated, redirected, and at times reorganized for the welfare of all. As uh, Swami Dayanand Saraswati ji said, go back to the Vedas. We need, we Indians, we need to establish robust, feasible and universal synergies between the core philosophical value systems and the currently evolving vibrant domain of public policy. Now by core philosophical value systems, I mean the very profound, thought-provoking, non-violent, and universal streams of political consciousness which Mother India has gifted to the world. The need for such a vibrant, synergetic framework of public policy arises because, as the ancients thought, the more powerful holds are apt to transgress into the fears of the less powerful, and quite unfortunately, the right is often identified with the interest of the strong. For India to become the public policy capital of the world in the future, it would be extremely important for all of us to, uh, to shed knowledge 
on what our beloved philosophers and social reformers such as uh, sant kabir ji sant goraknath ji sant ravidas ji maharshi valmiki ji sant surdas ji sant tulsidas ji ma meera bai ji uh, and also we should make sure that all their philosophies find due expression in our governance and public policy infrastructure we must not forget that india was is and will forever be the bhakti and yoga capital of the world it is this all pervasive bhakti yoga which will once again give birth to the much needed composite culture of peace non violence and universalism in india only if we successfully assimilate the vedic world view the upanishadic philosophy the non violent value systems of the buddhist jain sikh and islamic traditions we would undoubtedly be able to contribute our best in making india the policy capital of the world so far as effective entrepreneurship is concerned because effective entrepreneurship plays a very crucial role in indian economy we should note that there are internal loopholes and external risks which may weaken india's entrepreneurial infrastructure and women play a very integral cohesive role in strengthening india's entrepreneurial infrastructure for instance in order to engender a robust entrepreneurial ecosystem the state should make sure that the economic reforms are not slow and incomplete but if there is so much of political violence after the uh, after any election i can i can guarantee that no kind of entrepreneurial framework will develop everyone and basically the citizens will be terrorized they would just try to flee that state or let's say they would they they all of their rights will be jeopardized it would be just like a survival of the fittest kind of thing so uh, the pace the pace of economic reforms will become extremely slow for instance opening up of the indian market is still ongoing and lacks complementary reforms for robust implementation uh again an example such as uh, the slow labor reforms due to differences between union and state policies so the lack of cohesion between the center and the state gives rise to n number of problems and the women are the uh, um the the women are the population which faces the brunt of all these problems legal issues are also one uh, another problem such as uh, restrictive la uh, labor laws then lengthy compliance lengthy litigation of disputes delays in clearance due to environmental concerns corruption etc should also be addressed for us to be able to engender a sustainable environment environment friendly entrepreneurial framework we should also be able to infuse more competitiveness into the economy which again is attacked if political violence uh, and hooliganism masquerades as politics india's exports suffer on cost as we know and quality due to high logistics cost high fluctuations in raw material prices uh, due to uh, high unstable inflation then over dominance of the msme sector obsolete technology and no assured environment friendliness in india only 4.69% of workers are formally skilled as compared to 24% in china 75% in germany and 96% in south korea so uh, the government should also uh, play its due role in upskilling women and turning them into skilled workers so that they can empower themselves and that would be the real atmanirbhar bharat lack of skilled manpower in the entrepreneurial economy increases the fear of the youth in the private sector and discourages them from taking risks due to little supporting ecosystem and this is again aggravated by the uh, political violence hooliganism masquerading as politics we should also be able to engender a public policy framework leveraging which the entrepreneurial ecosystem will be least impacted by cyclical slowdowns in global markets 
India should build its economic and public policy framework on the foundations of the value systems engineered by our beloved saints. In the words of Dr. Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar, यह तीन लोकों से न्यारी काशी सुज्ञान धर्म और सत्य राशि बसी है गंगा के रम्य तट पर यह सर्व विद्या की राजधानी यह सर्व विद्या की राजधानी I would like to emphasize that it is gyan, dharm, and satya alone which can universally transform the shrine of India in particular and the world in general. Thank you so much for giving me this very wonderful opportunity to express myself on this very pertinent topic. And I would like to get some suggestions and questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lopa Mudra ji. Uh, Vibhuti ma'am, if you Lopa have... Lopa Mudra ji, it is uh, okay as an essay, but you need to, if it is a research base, then you will have to make it focus in one particular area because in one paragraph only, you are highlighting four or five themes. Uh, politics, governance, violence, uh, spirituality, and uh, also the 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 quotations of the philosophers, religious philosophers and all. So you know, for if you are aiming uh, only as a submission, that's fine. But if you want it to be included as a chapter, then you will have to focus and provide a lot of substantive uh, research references and all. So how do you want to go about it? Um, Ma'am, I would like to uh, present it or let's say publish it uh, in the form of an essay. Yeah, so but in essay, but what would be the... Uh, focus of your because it's too broad what you are it, yeah it, it looks um, like a, yeah it's okay for a eight March speech but for a research paper you need to narrow down the scope and also do much more rigorous uh, analytically rigorous work with substantive references no to to support your argument so are you do you want to focus on political issue or governance issue or um, mob violence or economic uh, this thing because you have also talked about the economic policies you are also talking about the labor laws and conflict industrial relations uh, between workers and uh, this thing so each one of them is a spe special domain so you'll have to choose which domain you would like to focus on and then start doing the review of literature and build your argument and uh, pathway for future Okay. Yeah. So, we, what yeah. would you like to take up? Global macro policies you want to take up? So um, that's, that would be. You know, are you a student of economics? No, no, I'm not a student of economics. I am looking for pursuing uh, my degree in law, no. and um, so I would like to take up uh, the issue. I mean, I would like to synergize um, public policy and. Uh, and the and the current uh, public policy uh, and the current challenges that uh, public policy framework in india faces and uh, i would like to shed light on my own state west yeah, bengal okay case study of west bengal yeah 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 okay, okay yeah so just focus on that and start doing a liter uh, literacy scan of reports articles and books on the subject and then come up with a review of literature do your gap analysis and try to make your uh, article or chapter as a unique because okay. whatever has happened so far you can't repeat that you have to come up with your own so that would be fine yeah, yeah. Hmm. good that's a good idea case study of West Bengal hmm. it was also, Vibhuti, it was also very nationalistic and uh, Lopaji was focusing more on ancient saints and also Lopaji yeah. you can also look at uh, which women saints what are they saying and in massaging India that will also be something which that you can... That would be a separate topic, yeah. The same poet is. In fact, Nira Desa has written a lot in Bhakti ah. Movement. Nira Desa, Vinama Jumdar. Mm. Then we have a separate books written by Parita Mukta or Mirabai. So that, that is another topic which you can take up. The contribution of uh, uh, Bhakti Movement from 12th century to 19th, to 18th century, you can take up, yeah. That is... That and, can, then, yeah. and then, Lopaji, you can uh, uh, have public Nari Shakti, India and World, something like that. You can do some research. It can also be a very good paper. You can take guidance from your Bhuti, ma'am. 
but think about it yeah some more focus paper it but was what very... she says it now is about west bengal case study that mm. seems doable because otherwise bhakti movement from 12th century to this and doing mm. critically reflecting generally most of the studies are from the literature and sociology perspective either sociologist or the literature department they have focused more on that no or even history historians have also done it so if mm. you think that uh, you are at ease with that then you can do one bhakti uh, movement but then again with west bengal raja yeah. ramon a lot of figures also come in sir that is a social but, reform movement it's not uh, bhakti they were a very much rationalist brahmos were rationalist they were not spiritual they were very much uh, down to earth reality they were dealing with no but then with west bengal a lot of other things will come yeah, but think yeah. about it lopa ji yeah yeah, yeah. but narrow down to one particular topic examine it thoroughly and provide all the documentary evidences for the statements and that you are making yeah. thank you so much ma'am and thank you so much lopa matra ji for your presentation uh, now we'll be going back to preetha ji so priyanka if you can priyanka ji if you can please share the video of the one that has been shared okay meanwhile swati ji you also want to present Oh, no. Is it audible? Yeah, only subtitles oh. are not there. Yeah. Ha. Huh. Do you have no. subtitles in English? Subtitles, no, ma'am. It's a raw file. Okay. Okay. Uh, but no issue. Maya, uh -huh. Priyanka, let me start. send you a temperature. Maya, what happened? Maya, are you okay? Do we need to see a doctor? Scene two at the clinic.
Thank you so much, uh, Pritha ji, for that uh, video. Uh, Professor Vibhuti, ma'am, if you have anything to add. Ma'am, you're on mute. Your presentation, you'll be presenting a paper, no? Yeah. Yes, I, I will be and, taking. Um, uh, methodology that, yeah. And this will be part of the methodology that you have used for creative, for animation and public education. That, that way it will go. No. Your play, uh, not. What yeah, are the that, that, that is just a part oh. of the creative project. So project. The method, yeah, yeah. I would be. Uh, I would want to do anecdotal evidences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. This also you can incorporate in a section that methods you have used. It's not only lecture method. Lecture method, interactive method, uh, play, songs, okay. uh, awareness generation song. So that would be campaign building and public education. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. And, it's nice. Also. Uh, also, uh, ma'am, okay, all, uh, all the all those who are making videos, they can share the video with us. We'll put it on our uh, YouTube. So, we'll book maybe uska link de denge. We'll put the link in the book and essays so people can access from there yeah. also. That we can also like, do. Rinka, we can coordinate. Now, Mr. Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So we yes. also have uh, Miss Anna Usha Abram. She is from a media person. So can, does she have any suggestion to uh, Miss Pritha? Usha ji, are you there? Hello? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, ah, Professor yeah. Vibhuti. What is your suggestion? You are a media specialist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I hello. Think, uh, uh, hello. Can you hear me? I think we should actually yes. have subtitles also, which can be easily put on this video because uh, it's a little difficult to hear what is being said. So maybe subtitles will help. It's a very good way to have different mediums of uh, expression, not only presentations and written media. Yeah. Pictures, posters, videos, everything will be good. Yeah, so the training module that you have, uh, is it oh, you only are doing it or you have also TOT? Uh, you are doing uh, training of the trainers, Ms. Pritha? Uh, for the, are you for doing the TOT? No, I, uh, I'm actually a part of the founding team of an organization called uh, Citizens for Law and Democracy. And uh, two of the founders and co-founders, they have been working on this research for 15 years. So, so why don't you do a case study of this organization also, in-depth case study of their work in last 15 years, that also you make a part of your paper. It should be very, because then then other organize, other states and other places also, it can be replicated. No? So if you do the whole documentation, which is called a process documentation in the Correct. research language, process documentation of this organization and the tools for training and uh, public education that they have used to put forward their uh, point, no? 
that why english education is definitely ma'am yes ma'am i'll be yeah. sure to ensure thanks yeah and Pritha so ji organizing or... your material because you have massive material how are you are going to organize that material to come up with 5000 say 5000 words of chapter no we have between 3500 to 5000 words you will have you will have to come up with the subtitle section in that one portion can be process documentation of this organization's work over last 15 years and what are the knowledge resources they have created so that that can be used and are they in public domain can others use it are they uh, easily uh, accessible all that you can bring yeah. and also Definitely, tried, uh, prita ji also yeah. tried to have other languages case studies as well small small take bengali take marathi take gujarati because it's a universal problem which you are highlighting It's not just limited to Tamil or uh, let not us say. Not Tamil. She says English yeah. language. Yeah. Her, yeah. her and, argument, central yeah. argument yeah. is need for English language for yeah something yeah. universal. Yeah, but the problem is everywhere, no? Yeah. Even That's... even in in Bihar or let us say Punjab. So that that yeah. will mean the issue. Special. How can it be used? Same it model need... can be used in different contexts. Correct. Yeah. Okay. That's very good. Absolutely. If I can just take a minute to actually explain how they do this. So they have a drill methodology which is implemented in government schools. So they teach English, uh, like I already said, through the regional language. Let's say Midi Vandi. It's a Tamil term which means bicycle. But they when when they say the drill Midi Vandi bicycle, they are actually able to pictureize what this word means because in Tamil Midi as in pedal and Vandi as in vehicle. So when you say bicycle, they might not actually know it's a vehicle, but when they are learning it from their language, they're able to conceptually understand this. Right. So we do this scientifically for all subjects. Let's say isolated triangle, and when they learn the term in their regional language, they're actually able to conceptualize the subject as well. So I think that's the unique uh, part of the drill. I'll be I'll be sure to document all of this in uh, as a part of my research. They have a huge uh, members or uh, membership of the researchers. Who work on this uh, module, sir? No, sorry, ma'am, I didn't get your question. Do they have a huge team of researchers who work on these modules, sir? Who who come up with this vocabulary and terminology and teaching methods and all? The founder and co-founder they've been working for fifteen years. They have just made it into an organization. Uh, it's one or two years old. Now they're building the organization. So their entire doctoral research has been on this. Okay, that's the precedence. Yeah. टिक फॉर मी and um last week i lost my job as well so i have not been in the right frame of mind like you know the abstract that i had submitted and things that i wanted to do so what i have right now is just merely something that i have you know for the formal requirement you know i intend to obviously because i have contact of some policy consultants who work with the government so i can get the data you know what i had intended you know while sending the abstract so i if you know i you know get back to normalcy i hope so i mean we have to move on you know so i'll be developing that into a proper paper you know the thing the way it should be you know so right now it is just merely things that i want to do captions you know so right now the presentation is merely a mishmash of something so but i wanted so that you know to be there i wanted to show up i wanted to turn up so uh how do i do that share screen yeah is it open your yeah, ppt is open yeah. is it double click to enter full screen yeah okay. is it visible yes yeah, it is in it, working mode yeah you can see slide show above yeah. right top yeah, uh, yeah. uh so i had uh, taken up this topic of beti bachao beti padhao and uh, what i actually wanted to do here is that you know it's more of a catch phrase more of a slogan and you know uh, in even in normal uh, you know uh, 
you know, when people would talk, it would look like it's merely a slogan. And has the government, what I wanted to see, has the government actually, are there actually, you know, credible things, things that have been done concretely, you know, or, or you know, in various government measures, you know, certain efforts have been taken to do things. So as I was told that, yes, there have been visible, uh, you know, some uh, data changes and some uh, difference, uh, some reduction in uh, problematic areas as well. And there are certain developments that we, that are positive. And obviously there are the loop sides that I wanted to explore. So, Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao is a tri-ministerial initiative of the Ministries of Women and Child Development, Health and Family Welfare and Education. It aims to address the issue of declining child sex ratio and empower girls and women through education, health and social protection. And when we say social protection, uh, so many things come to our mind, you know, not only the government measures but also the set of public measures that are there that we as a society uh, provide to the citizens to to the members of the society uh, so for economic uh, so whether a child is able to go to school or not whether a mother is having a proper uh, you know even even the society is it even concerned about that or not and how does this initiative even take care of that or even consider that so the scheme was launched by uh, our Prime Minister Narendra Modi on January 22, 2015 in Panipat, Haryana, one of the states with the lowest CSR, that is child sex ratio, in the country. The scheme initially had covered 100 districts with low CSR and was later expanded to 405 districts in 2018. Uh, so the scheme... Uh, How do I just I think one slide is has just skipped. Can you go back first. How do I go back? You can use the uh, arrow buttons in your keyboard. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So the scheme has two components. Um one is the media, you know, with the help of mass communication campaign. And the other component of the scheme is multi-sectoral intervention. When we, uh, so the mass communication campaign involves media advocacy, you know, through advertisements, we, uh, you know, encouragement to YouTube videos, social mobilization, and community engagement programs to create awareness and, cha uh, uh, and challenge the social norms that devalue girls and women. For example, we might remember you know, there was a very popular thing, selfie with daughter campaign. And and though it would look like, you know, um that these things do not actually achieve anything in on, on the material sphere. Yet, you know, there were many people, especially from Haryana, because they had to show that, you know, they are also with the uh, rest of the country. So they would uh, post their selfies with their daughters. Uh, here, why what I want to put out is, is that, you know, uh, here I want to bring in J.S. Mill's idea of the, you know unusual is unnatural so you know in our uh, in our society where a male child is very much cherished so you know when everybody around you know would be talking of daughters and you know encouragement then slowly you know when, when what becomes very usual also becomes very natural choice for us so it might look like these are things what 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 is you know this happening in the popular media or they might not actually bring any material change, but they do have some impact in changing the mindset or, you know, even bringing, and obviously mindsets do not change, change by evolution. So these things do have impact, uh, you know, in the civil society. The, so the second component of the scheme was the multi-sectoral intervention, which means a coordinated action by various stakeholders. So, you know, from Department of Health and other, you know, all the okay. machineries that are there, uh, they should, how do they help women or how do they help, you know, in the empowerment of the girl child to improve the CSR, ensure survival and protection of the girl child and enhance their education and participation. Like, for example, promotion of early registration of pregnancy, institutional deliveries and registration of birth by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, making schools girl friendly, uh, you know, girl friendly, like, you know, 
we are many asha workers and anganwadi sevikas <laughs> and you know uh, they help a lot in you know carrying on the message of the government so through them how through the existing structures and also through newer schemes uh, how the government intended to uh, you know uh, you know create more awareness towards uh, not only um uh you know encouraging the birth of female child but also you know uh, empowering them through education and other means so the scheme has shown some positive results in improving the csr and the sex ratio at birth in the sel in selected districts i wanted to do a proper case study of haryana which i hope i'll be able to do right now i do not have the data so according to the health management information system of the ministry of health and family welfare the srb uh, or the srb has improved by 34 points from 903 in 2014-15 to 937 in 22-23 uh and according to the sample registration system of the registrar general of india the srb has improved by 3 points from 896 in in 1517 to 899 in 1617 2016 18 sorry the scheme has also contributed to the empowerment of girls and women through various schemes and initiatives so there are some existing schemes that have been taken into account and there are some new ones that also came up like for example sukanya samriddhi yojana which came in 2015 so it is a saving scheme in which the parents are encouraged to invest 1000 rupees per month and after the maturation they will get certain amount similarly similarly there is this pradhan mantri matri vandana yojana in which young mothers so when they have their first child they get rupees 5000 in two installments and on the second child they will get 6000 then you have the ujwala yojana which otherwise it would look like it's merely you know just uh, um improving the life the life of women uh, you know who earlier had to work on smoke chulhas but it you know when a woman when the mother is healthier or happier then obviously it will impact the you know the way the child is nourished so that way by you know empowering mothers the child would also be empowered so indirectly that way through ujwala scheme as well uh, you know the the child children in general and the female child or women they are uh, you know protected then we have this swadhar grah uh, and this 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 scheme is for it is it exists from 2006 7 i think and it helps women in distress so any kind of uh, uh, any kind of problem that they might be going through so here there are many centers that are there in every district and every district they would you know appoint some 30 women who will be on the lookout for such women who might need any kind of help whether it is from you know something that uh, has happened in their family or you know whether it is on economic front then we have mahila shakti kendra that ha that is there in throughout the country then the other uh, you know schemes that are already there that like pradhan mantri uh, uj pradhan mantri ujwala yojana i think i have talked about it then uh, pradhan mantri awas yojana pradhan mantri kaushal vikas yojana so somehow so when we talk of multi sectorial uh, you know intervention mm -hmm. because you know uh, empowering a child or you know empowering anybody any human's uh, life they are dependent on multiple factors you know so we we live in a very interconnected world so you know, one needs to be given support from all the side uh, then only the child or any child not only female child would be empowered so then we talk about the impact on the civil society as i uh, earlier mentioned that you know we we'll, uh, that when something gets talked about whether because the government is putting impetus on it or because what we see in the media or what we see on in films or popular imagination they, they they these are soft power so soft so somehow they are influencing the way people think or perceive the world so when you know when you have a slogan like that so then uh, you know people you know catch up on that so there are there have, so the scheme has received positive response and support from the civil society and the media including cinema 
so there are many celebrities you know who would either either even it is for a twitter post or you know in whatever you know uh, csr activities that they do so they would bring up the topic they would talk about or you know they will conduct a show they will go to such programs and then talk about it with the hashtag beti bachao bachao beti padhao so that way also the issue gets talked about uh, so the issue gets endorsed and promoted then some films also came out you know uh, uh, that uh, that may, that might not be they might not be directly uh, an impact of uh, the scheme but because such things were there in the air so and because the movies are also looking out for the current social problems that can be portrayed on the big screen so we had movies like dangal secret superstar toilet ek prem katha padman ran bhumi chori uh, so such movies brought on the topic uh, of you know and they aided in the awareness campaign that was launched by this uh, scheme uh however as we say uh, as we see that you know uh, the responses on ground uh, first of all because of lack of data you know obviously the amount of money that has been spent and how much uh, was uh, could be actually utilized there could be huge gap in that so we have problems like uh, inadequate budget allocation and utilization lack of convergence and coordination among different departments and agencies lack of monitoring and evaluation mechanism to actually see because uh, these are very these are prob very social problems so they take you know, so for things to materialize on the ground it might be very a long term thing so to, whether we have a proper monitoring uh, you know system to evaluate whether these schemes are actually working and especially in proportion to the amount that is being spent on that that needs to be you know looked at and despite all that despite these things despite the awareness despite the encouragement we still living in a world that sees you know a female child as a liability and a male child as an asset so we have we still have the unethical practice of sex determination and sex select selection even though if it is illegal we had movies uh, we had um uh um, i forget the name of a movie that was about this uh, uh you know sex selection process so um while there are hopes that there are things that actually uh, you know helped in the encouragement and awareness towards this issue yet there is a lot that is to be achieved uh, materially uh, as well and uh, even on the consciousness level so thank you so that was it Thank you so much, Swati ji. Ah, uh, Vibhuti ma'am, if you have any, I have two comments because most of your data is pre-pandemic. Pandemic has changed the scenario. Two years of pandemic, where PCP and DT Act was freezed, has also resulted in massive uh, abuse of this technology of ultrasound. And UNFPA data, if you go through the UNFPA report, which says that sex selective abortions have increased drastically, they have also done some estimate. Another thing is that Betty uh, Bachao, Betty Padao, you said that uh, inadequate fund utilization, only 128 crore being used uh, so far out of 700 and some 80 crores. Uh, that also has gone only for media publicity. So actual uh, work at a PHC level or at a strengthening of public health system or support for the funding for uh, implementation of PCP and DT Act. Because if you go through the PCP and DT Act, Vigilance Committee, appropriate authority, uh, the the uh, regular visit and monitoring of the uh, diagnostic centers, about that money is not used. So I think you will have to also go through the deconstruct the union budget which comes under the special uh, uh, centrally sponsored scheme and at a subnational level also what is happening and it is there material is there unfp has done it nfhs uh, data of uh, round 5 has provided because round 5 was con conducted in two parts 2021 and 2122 and even the budget uh, unutilized fund data are also 2122 so I think th that, that you'll have to bring it. Otherwise, what you are saying, it, the closing date is 2019. It's a pre-pandemic. In the post-pandemic period, there are, the trends have changed. 
and also the utilization of funds. Because when it was free, specific entity was freeze during pandemic, there was no, no total non-utilization of funds because the, the, the attention was on corona prevention. So, but it's, other, yeah, perspective is right. And the way you have scrutiny of your all the flagship schemes, that is also very important. Only thing you have to update it. And, also, some uh, more scheme, Lakpati Didi and others has been announced, Swati Ji. You can include that. Aap Haryana ke or Government of India ke na, Ministry of Women wale pe ja kar, you can see a list. Abhi elections hai na. Sabla scheme also. Haryana also is a ah, Sabla ah, scheme for adolescent girls. Yeah. Yes, SSGs. Uh, us pe bahut jada push bhi aara hai. So you can And see. even the role of Panchayati Rai, because now Haryana also is a 50% elected representatives. What are they doing at a ground level? That mm -hmm. also will be very interesting. And Nirmala. there are studies on Panchayati Raj institutions' role in the post pandemic period. Don't get into HMS, uh, HMIS data and other things. That is very uh, complicated. Usma maybe 10 20 percent error. Hota hai. But if you're getting literature, more data paper, then you cite those. But don't go very deep. Otherwise, it will take time. Right? We do, then we take one, two, three years to develop that kind of paper. No? Yeah, correct. Okay, take over to you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir and ma'am, for your feedback. And thank you so much, Swati Ji, for your presentation. With this, we come to an end of all the participants' presentations that we had lined up for today. Just a few announcements. The deadline for the submission of the essay has been extended to 17th March from 15th March. And all the participants who have uh, created a video for their creative projects should share it with us on our email ID. I've shared the email ID as well in the chat box. Additionally, feedback forms will be shared. Please fill those forms. Now, I would... Uh, Riyaji, do you have a question? Yeah, she has raised hand. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have one question. Uh, so... Ma'am, uh, my topic is Indian state response toward homosexuality. So I'm looking forward to, uh, for the chapter contribution, this topic. So I'm confused with related to conceptual framework. Like I'm writing a research paper on this topic and I'm using literature review methodology. So for conceptual framework, I'm thinking to uh, use Iris Median Young, Logic of Masculinist Protection, Unka ek, uh, reading, I have read that reading, uh, Security State, and uh, um, Agamemnon, Giorgio Agamemnon's State of Exception. So is it okay or could you please give me some suggestions for conceptual Foucault, framework? No? You also quoted Foucault, History of Sexuality. Okay. No, you also mm -hmm. put it. So Foucauldian thinking also about yes, sexuality and violence. No, the, because that in his book also Madness and Civilization, he talks about how the people, sexual minorities are treated throughout the history. He goes to the Roman culture and Greek culture and uh, the historically uh, how it has uh, been done. Simone de Beauvoir in Second Sex has also talked about the patriarchal mm -hmm. control over sexuality, not only of women, but all the sexual minorities and all those who are perceived as weak, children, person who is thin and short, uh, poor, unemployed, homeless, people living on the streets, all of them become target of the, the marginalization, stigmatization and sexual abuse. No? So I think you can either, you know, and also intersectional framework is excellent. Intersectional vulnerabilities, because even among the homosexual, those who are rich and those who live in a big houses and those who were aristocrats and kings, they never had a problem. Okay? They could hide. Even the people who are the media barons, if they are homosexual, they don't have a problem. They can easily check in in five-star hotel and do whatever they want. It is the people who are on the street who are abused, who are thrown out of their homes, and those who are, especially the the, the uh, uh, those who are in the institutions, because these Adivasi girls who had a lesbian relationship, how they were persecuted, both of them burned themselves alive. Such kind of horrible cases we hear about the remand of. It is basically the powerlessness. So I think power as an analytical category would be very, very useful. And that you can draw from Foucault also. 
no? And also, we have one book in Imprint Books of huh. Beyond Binaries. Uh, yeah, yeah. that would be very useful. It has all the resources. Very yes, good yes. person. Yes. Do you have that book? Uh, I have done my... that course. Huh? Ma'am, I have uh, done that course. So you have done that course actually. Yeah, so you must be having the book. No? book so references, refer- even the resources are given. All the links for the resources are given. But I think for power would be a very powerful way of looking at the issue. Because if you only keep it gender binary, that it, it you won't be able to give justice to the topic. No? Yes, ma'am. Because I'm, uh, yeah, like, I'm trying to analyze it how a state is powerful. And yeah. state control sexuality. Yeah, but, but then there are dynamics also, no? The same state, uh, British state, which uh, incarcerated and came up with 377. Post independence periods, though we have a very progressive constitution which gives you Article 14, 15, 16, 21, could not give justice, uh, could not, uh, they, they could not think that they could have repealed 377. Why did it happen? Nalsa judgment. Then the repeal of 377. After the conservative forces, they prevailed upon the state, uh, uh, the, again, criminalization of homosexuals. And after that, uh, the, so the tug of war between the home, LGBTQIA community and the state. I think that mm-hmm. dynamics also you can bring out in your paper, no? And I think that booklet, as Dr. Rajan Kumar said, that book, booklet has captured the pulses of this whole 200 years of history from colonial times till the present. Riyaji, yeah, you write it once, then uh, you share it with Professor Patel. She will help you. Yeah. In terms of writing, okay. you also have to be concise. So be very careful. Yeah. Uh, what should be 5,000. 5,000. Uh, yeah. 5,000. Uh, 5, so share. don't yeah. stress. Uh, be very concise into that. Right, huh? right. Otherwise, it will become dissertation. Yeah. And what is the deadline? 10th of March 20th. or the 15th no. of March? 17th of 17th, 17th Sunday. 17th March, extended. 17th, 17th March. It, it's a Sunday, so we are giving weekend to you know, work upon it. Okay, ma'am. Before that, even I can submit now to get the feedback, and even I have yeah, to improve draft, something. Draft you can like. submit. That yes. will be good for you. No? That will be good for you. Do that. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, the floor is now open for any feedback from the participants. If you have any feedback about the course, please feel free to unmute. We'll also be sharing the feedback form. It's a long course, so take your time. Uh, yeah. Give your feedback, in, uh, in-depth feedback within that. You will respond to that. Or, oh. yeah, Anisha ji, you want to have something to say? Yeah, so more than feedback, it's about gratitude. I'm so happy to be a part of this fellowship. And all the 10 days, like, and all those amazing women that we could hear from. And I didn't even know that there are so many things behind policy and how much people have to go through and what happens at the grassroots level because me being uh, in the academia and uh, trying to reach out to students that being my way of uh, like getting back or giving back to the society and trying to reach people so getting to know all these other perspectives and so many variations to it it was very enlightening and inspiring thank you so much for compiling such an amazing course and thank you all of you for being a part of this. Thank you so much, Professor Vibhuti Patel and, and all the others, especially all the people who have been part of the organizing team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashina. Thank you, Ashina. Is there anyone else who would like to add? Anna, would you like I, to say, Usha? I would like to. Yeah. The resource person, what do you feel? Because you have attended several very... sessions and even watched mm-hmm. all videos. so yeah. It was very interesting. Um, I only have one suggestion that, you know, we need to question the status quo, whether it was LGBT or whether uh, even the other programs, Beti Bachao, anything. It's not just uh, looking at what is there and then giving a... You need to question whether, you know, it's actually doing what it is supposed to do. And is that what today's uh, 
youth want you are all so young and your life is completely different from what our lives were professor patel and myself and all of us we grew up in a different country i mean same kind of different kind of a situation so you need to question whether the old is relevant or not in everything that you do is the only thing that i can add but i really need to thank vibhuti patel uh, professor vibhuti patel for spending so much of time and effort in every weekend being there you know on time listening to everything so carefully explaining it's really giving back to society and i hope the youth will really really take this as uh, you know it's not something everybody does and hope you all will all understand how much Uh, she's putting in an effort and uh, give your best to it please thank you yeah but i think they are also giving their best if you see the publications in less than five publications we have already had in book where their uh, submissions are included they have, they have also put in equally uh, hard labor and also lot of uh, new things which have come up i think that is also commendable so it's a two way process teaching learning so we have also learned a lot from your uh, articulations your case studies your personal testimonies and uh, your final draft and writing and back and forth we have had on email <laughs> that is also very educative for all of us yes. mm -hmm. we'll try to make it the theme for the next year for uh, young women's leaders public policy fellowship uh, challenging the status quo that's a very nice suggestion challenging thank the you. status quo would be a very good thing yeah. yeah very good why not to critically look at all the things so that we come out with more relevant suggestion and we can do also comparison comparative uh, of with other countries policies and all yes. that is the possible yeah publications Cross, will cross also. country comparison can also we will do that. we'll do that yes yeah. We are above more than three hours, so we put the opportunity to wrap with yeah, your yeah, contact. Yeah, we will. Ask. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So now it is my privilege to call upon Professor Bhupati Patel ji to deliver the closing chair remarks. Yeah, I think uh, I I must uh, appreciate uh, today's. Uh, whole session because right from madam kanta singh's presentation and she her seven key points she brought out for young women policy makers and how they can be more effective in the policy space from there to the presentation of, of the participants and the kind of serious themes which they have chosen whether it's the stalking or refugee uh, condition of refugees or homosexuality or uh, the the concepts such as men's planning and gaslighting in political participation inclusive domestic policy uh, all these are very very important and even the macro analysis which uh, young uh, participant tried to uh, connect political economy and uh, governance and politics and spirituality and aesthetics it's a very bold way of looking at the current reality what emerges from all this 10 days session is one we all are committed to our commitment to collective good because that is the role of legislation and policy uh, sensitivity towards care work how to reduce care work for women how to recognize its importance and how to reward care work when it is paid so i think these three r's are important transnational solidarity uh, that has also come up whether it by while discussing uh, status of rohingya or, or 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 status of refugees i think that also it came up in several talks as well as in the research topic gender sensitization as a need of aware and awareness about our privileges and your vulnerabilities i think this many uh, many resource persons also reiterated it and today uh, kanta singh ji also told us that we need to be our privileges how do we use our power and privileges for the betterment of people who are left behind uh, and the question of lifelong learning very important we have to always keep our eyes and ears and minds open so that we can understand the complexity and the unfolding reality in a more 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 appropriate and realistic way representation of all genders in decision making body that also came out in several presentations whether it is a youth policy or action plan or schemes or programs the debate on culture and also debate of uh, the, the 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 culture of tolerance culture of 
resolving your differences, not with gun and violence, but with debate, discussion, discourses. And even after that, if we have differences, we should be kind to each other. These are the honest difference of opinion. And as I think, as uh, our, our, our participant from Bengal, she said that we need to bring aesthetics in the policy discourse, which is very important. Nonviolent response to difference of opinion and peaceful coexistence with nature, with fellow human beings, with the society and community we live in. I think that also came. I would like to end with my favorite Beatles song, John Lennon's 1971, Imagine. Imagine there is no heaven. It is easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all people living for today. Ah, imagine there are no countries. Isn't it hard to do? Nothing to kill or die for and no religion too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You, you may say I am a dreamer, but I am not the only one. I hope someday you will join us. And the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger. What Lennon says, a brotherhood of man. I have changed it to a humanhood of human being. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. You, you may say I am a dreamer. But I am not the only one. I hope someday you will join us. And the world will leave as on and as we feminists say nari mukti ke saath saath manav mukti laenge manav mukti ke saath saath nari mukti laenge along with the women's liberation we will strive for human liberation and along uh, while fighting for human liberation we will never forget and we will always emphasize women's liberation thank you very much Thank you so much, ma'am. It has truly been an honor and privilege to have you serve as our chair for the event. Your expertise and insights have truly enriched our understanding in every session. Your dedication to excellence and your ability to guide discussions with clarity and wisdom have mm -hmm. made a significant impact on all of us present. Um, your contributions have been invaluable and have deeply, and we are deeply appreciative of your time and effort, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Imprit team. Well, you, I think our pace of commitment and hard work is the same. That's why I think we click so well because you are also so committed and the rate at which you work, you put in your hundred more than 100 person that also acts as an inspire, uh, inspiration to me. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. So as we come to an end of Young Women Leaders in Public Policy Fellowship, an online national winter school program a two-month online immersive introductory leadership certificate training fellowship. I, Reet Lath, researcher, IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, would like to propose the formal vote of thanks on behalf of IMPRI Gender Impact Studies Center. We are grateful to our experts for the day, Ms. Kanta Singh Ji and Professor Vibhuti Patel Ji for taking out their valuable time and giving us an opportunity to learn from this online certificate program. As we draw curtains on this enriching two month long course, I extend my heartfelt gratitude to all the distinguished speakers for their unwavering commitment and invaluable contributions. Your dedication in sharing your profound insights and expertise has been the cornerstone of this educational journey, enriching us all with a wealth of knowledge. I also wish to express my sincere appreciation to each and every participant for joining this intellectual voyage. Your active engagement, thought-provoking questions, and enthusiastic participation in our discussions has significantly enriched the depth of and quality of our deliberations. We look forward to welcoming you all to future events like these. We are grateful if you're watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our various podcasts or reading our publications. We hope you continue to join into our future in pre-web policy talk and web policy learning. Wishing you all a very good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Britain. Three cheers to all of us.